Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, the Poketown store has got you covered. You can even get a 5% discount on your orders using the Omnipoke code. For today's video, we are going to be going over the most interesting and influential cards from the coming up Cosmic Eclipse set. Uh, one of the last Sun and Moon sets that we'll have. It's going to come out on the 1st of November and is going to be first playable at the LATAM International Championships. Uh, to really start to kick off this season with some of the biggest events of the year. So the set is monstrous and there's a lot to be said about some of these cards, so we'll be going over all of them today. First of all, uh, with the ratings, really they're mainly based on standard. I'll maybe discuss expanded here and there if it's relevant, but for the most part we're looking at standard format and you can always uh, check out the rating in the top right of the screen just to get a quick idea of where I think the card is at. And we'll go over the star ratings really briefly. Um, one star for things that are cute but probably won't see much play. Uh, two stars are for cards that have some potential, could be experimented with, but overall won't be all that powerful. Three star cards, I believe, are promising cards which may end up going into decks that we're already um, aware of, but also could end up being, you know, the base of a below top tier archetype, but one that's still, you know, part of the meta. Four star cards are pretty impressive, they'll certainly see play and they'll have a notable impact on either new decks um, or adapting how current decks are played at the moment. And then five stars are the real big winners, cards you definitely need to keep your eye on. They're key players in top tier archetypes or they're a card that will see play in a bunch of different decks as a staple option. So that being said, we also have the community majority ratings that you can take an eye on. Um, don't just take my opinion for it. There's also been over 200 people responding to the community set review. So thank you so much to everyone who got involved. It really does help out the channel. Um, so people don't just have my opinion. You also get to see the broad spectrum of where other people believe this card is sat. So we always kick off with the trainer cards. And the first one that we have is Beleba and Bryson Man. Uh, it's a very interesting supporter card. It's a tag team supporter as well. A new mechanic from um, this set, Cosmic Eclipse. There are some supporters which have the uh, tag team text on it. And that's actually quite important for a trainer card that you'll be seeing later called Tag Whistle. Uh, for this supporter in particular, it allows you to discard the top three card of each player's deck. And then uh, when you play this card, you can also choose to discard three other cards from your hand. So you have that primary effect. You can always just, as soon as you play the supporter, uh, you're discarding the top three cards from each player's deck. But if you choose, you can also discard three other cards from your hand. If you do, each player also discards bench Pokemon until he or she has three Pokemon on the bench. Uh, your opponent chooses the ones to discard first. So this is clearly a disruptive supporter. We've seen similar effects like this that like to mill the top of the deck. I think that's the crucial element of this card. The reason why I've given it such a high rating is because of that initial text. Discarding the top three from each player's deck is very similar to a Team Rocket's handiwork. Team Rocket's handiwork used to flip two coins and do two off your opponent's deck only um, for each heads you got. So this is usually a, a higher discard than Team Rocket's handiwork. Um, and although it does affect yourself, you can mitigate this because the type of deck that it will be played in is probably going to be a resource management Oranguru deck. We know how strong the Pidgeotto control archetype is right now. It's kind of flirting between tier one and tier two. It's had some very impressive regional results as of late. And uh, that is completely centering, centering around trying to remove cards from your opponent's um, hand and then eventually milling their deck as well, usually using a combination of Reset Stamp into Surge, into Jesse James, into Mars. So you make them draw cards off the stamp and then you discard those cards with Jesse James and Mars. Uh, the uh, new support that we have, Beleba and Bryson, uh, they really accelerate this. Uh, you can be discarding six cards from the opponent's deck all in one foul swoop with Surge and Bryson Man, Bryson Man, which is pretty insane. Obviously, you're discarding cards from your own deck as well, but this can be definitely mitigated by the Pidgeotto deck um, entirely because it's very often going to get to a point where it has no cards in its deck whatsoever, and when you do that, you can still play this supporter card, so you can have no adverse effect on yourself. You're basically just discarding the top three from your opponent's deck, and then you can resource management when you're from zero back to three cards in your... Um, uh, in your deck, which is incredible. So this is definitely going to be an include, I think, in Pidgeotto Control. It really accelerates the win condition of this archetype and dispels the myth that it will not be able to win in uh, 50 minutes a lot of the time. 
you really do accelerate your win condition with this archetype. So I feel like it's at least a one of and could possibly to be a two of in the deck. Right now, I still think Pidgeotto Control will have to have Mars and Jesse James in the deck anyway. So this will probably, in my opinion, just be a one of copy, but definitely does accelerate that win condition. You can go um, Bryson Man into Chip Chip, into Bryson Man into Chip Chip and like loop that combo instead. And it's way easier um to resource management back to those cards then the combination of needing the surge the jesse james the mars the stamp uh that's like you know four card combo whereas this is a two card combo you just keep getting back chip chip and bryson man and even when you do the mars jesse james combo you're still having to get chip chip back every time as well so this is a way easier way for pidgeotto control to ruin your opponent's deck uh much much quicker which is insane and also it makes your chip chips better in many cases because you're putting like the bad card to the top they're drawing that card and then you're like discarding the cards that you want them like not to draw into because you're obviously sh making them shuffle in the cards that you didn't chip chip as well so overall you're just going to get a good amount of high quality cards from the top three each time which is also pretty important next up we have clay uh, clay allows you to discard the top seven cards of your deck reveal uh, all items you discarded and put them into your hand so it's a powerful means of discarding a lot of things there's obviously um some keynotes here being able to cherry pick item cards is a pretty big deal uh, think about bill's analysis it's a very similar card functionally to that guy who's trying to cherry pick a couple um cards from the top seven obviously bill has a bit more flexibility because he gets trainers whereas clay is only uh item cards um so it's a little bit less flexible but if you have a top seven with more items you obviously get more access than bill also this could be compared to hapu um hapu is just discarding um four of your top six then you get to keep two of them clay potentially could allow you to keep many more of those cards if you go down the heavy item route in your deck uh, which is obviously very good. There's some key item cards out there right now. There's obviously Ball Search that we try and look for. There's like B-Strings if you're like a Blacephalon deck. There's um, things like um, Custom Catchers and Great Catchers coming out from this set as well that are worth digging towards. So having this extra discard synergy could actually end up being a benefit to some archetypes. Think about things like Mewtwo, which is sometimes playing Hapu right now just to have S extra discard uh, synergy. Um, I believe Clay could overtake Hapu in Mewtwo decks as that sort of like two copy supporter that you have alongside your welders. Uh, similarly, you could be having this in something like Blacephalon. I already mentioned B-String. I uh, already mentioned how it can be great for getting like treasures and whatnot. That could be a pretty good deal. And it could even end up being an early game supporter for um, Pika Rom, similar to how Bill's Analysis has become a popular card in Pika as of late. Um, you can have that discard synergy that can get rid of lightning energies. You already have so much access to... Um, electromagnetic radar that you've probably already thinned out the attackers that you need in the game um, so then you can just go ahead and play clay to get some lightnings in the discard pile and simply activate your tapu coco a little bit easier whilst also having access to those same usual cards so clay seems pretty powerful i don't think he's like a guaranteed card in any of these that's why i've only given him a three star rating but i think he's flexible enough and comparable enough to the likes of hapu and bill that he's going to be sort of like going toe to toe with them and in some cases he might win out as the supporter of choice in some of these builds next up we have cynthia and caitlin i think this is a very very promising supporter um mainly because it has this uh, tag team text on it so it is um tag whistleable so it's a very searchable supporter which is already just excellent for consistency um, but it allows you to simply put a supporter card from your discard pile into your hand. Uh, it can't be a Cynthia and Caitlyn, so it has to be something else. Um, but at the same time, when you play this card, you're allowed to discard another card from your hand, and if you do, draw three. I think this immediately overtakes Coach Trainer in um, Green's Guardian, um, very simply because Tag Whistle is already a great card for Guardian to be playing, and now you have a very searchable means of having draw support in your deck, as well as the fact that Caitlyn, uh, Caitlyn and Cynthia, they can get back more greens. And green is like the best card that you can play in any greens deck, as you all know. So simply having more copies of greens is excellent. We've even seen things like greens Reshizard play things like Lusamine in the deck. Yes, obviously Lusamine helps them get like key stadiums back at times. But a lot of the time it's also trying to get back greens and welders. And this once again, can be in that deck. And I feel like it will end up in Greenzard as well. 
um, because of Tag Whistle just being so strong. You can have a little mini engine going on there with Cynthia and Caitlyn. Even if it is just like a two copy kind of card, it just makes the Tag Whistles way better. Uh, they end up being like Cherish Balls that can also draw you three cards, which is just insane. So yeah, Tag Whistle is a crazy card and that's the reason why Cynthia and Caitlyn will probably see play because it will be switching up how Green's engines are built and makes them more consistent as well, uh, which is actually incredible. One of the sort of headaches of some of these uh, Guardian and uh, Green Zard decks is that if you just like whiff early Poker Gears and whatnot, you can't really do anything. Well, now you can play, instead of Cherish Balls, Tag Whistles, and then you have four extra outs to not only getting Pokemon down in the early stages, but also supporters. So Cynthia and Caitlyn is probably the best tag team supporter we have um, for the tag team decks, I would say. So really, really promising card that I think we'll see a lot of play. Guzmer and Haller is another tag team supporter. Um, it's a pretty niche card, um, but it has so many random combinations that I can just see this card going into decks that want to build around them. Once again, I'm pretty confident that Guardian will be playing a Tag Whistle engine. I'm pretty confident that things like Greenzard will play a Tag Whistle engine. So weaving in one Guzmer and Haller just for that option could be reasonable. What he does is he allows you to search your deck for a stadium and put it straight into your hand. But you're also allowed to discard two cards from your hand. If you do, you can also search for a tool and a special energy, reveal them and put them into your hand. I think this is specifically good for Guardian. I think Guzmer Haller will definitely go into Guardian as a one count because just grabbing, uh, you know, Tag Whistle turn one gets you your backup Guardian. Then you can go ahead and grab a Guzma and Haller. That can give you turn one Power Plant plus the Fairy Charm of your choice. And you could even weave in a couple copies of Draw Energy, a new energy card from this set, because uh, Fairy Song is for a colorless cost, as is Collider Storm as well. So um, I think both of those things spell... Um, a nice upgrade of engine for Guardian. I really do think the Tag Whistle is a big upgrade for Guardian. It's already like a tier 2 deck, but I think it gets pushed even further in this set, to be honest. I think it's going to be a top contender because Tag Whistle gives it so much more consistency. I'm definitely uh, like pretty happy to be playing Guardian in the future. I think it gets a lot more consistent. And even having some discards options in Guardian is actually a pretty big deal because currently... Uh, they can fall prey to stamps just because they have all these like excess fairy charms and other stuff that they like can't insta play from the hand in matchups where they're not relevant. Uh, so Guzmer and Halla having a little bit of discard in there is also pretty reasonable. So you may end up just playing like two copies of Draw Energy and then you already play just like one or two copies of your charms. But this gives you really good early access to them whilst also getting some more disruptive stuff on the go, which is really awesome. So I do think it's a mainstay in Guardian. I also think it could end up in all these other decks. Um, I think some tag teams will have to go down the Choice Helmet route thanks to the new addition of um, uh, the tag team, uh, the Reshiram Zekrom tag team that we're going to be talking about later in the video. There's a lot of uh, tag teams that kind of need to keep up with new tools to sort of fight against that archetype because it's such a big one hit hero merchant. The Choice Helmet might be the go-to option for a lot of these decks and it might mean that things like Mewtwo that is likely to add in a couple Tag Whistles can end up having Guzma and Haller in there as well as just that one count because it can get you things like Weak Guard Energy which has uh, become a bit more popular thanks to Tord uh, winning a regional with it in Mewtwo. Uh, there's a new supporter, Chaotic Swell, which I think is excellent in Mewtwo. Defending against Power Plant is obviously very good. Um, also Mewtwo known for playing like Giant Hearth as well on its own end. And then if Choice Helmet becomes like a relevant tool, that's definitely something Guzman and Haller can pick out. So I feel like this card is going to be like sometimes a one-of in decks that go heavier down the Tag Whistle route. And I think that's like the reason why he gets the three star. There's all sorts of other combinations out there. Another one just quickly, even if you're not playing Tag Whistle, something like Spiritomb could really benefit from this uh, card because it gets you three integral pieces. Hustle Belt for more damage, Rainbow for getting you further down in hit points and Shrine for, again, just more damage. So... Uh, Guzma and Haller basically gets you, like, what is that, like, 100 damage uh, in a supporter, basically, and gets you, like, a guaranteed attack off, which is insane. So, yeah, decent card. I think it's um, definitely, like, a one-of in the Tag Whistle kind of builds. Lily's Full Force is an interesting supporter card. Not all that strong on its own, but it's an activator for a Sogaleo and Lunala GX, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, if ever this card's going to see play, it's probably going to be in Malamar because it has this synergy with Sorgalera and Lunala. I don't think Lily's Full Force stands up on her own two feet strong enough to sort of beat out things like Erica and Bill and Hapu and all these other options. Uh, what she does is she allows you to draw four cards, and then if you have three or more cards at the end of your turn, you have to shuffle cards into your deck until you only have two. So 
there's definitely some downside to that. You never want to like have to redraw cards once you've drawn them once in the game, and that's exactly what Lily's Full Force will make you do um, if you're not able to like lower your hand size once you've drawn those four cards. So I think Malamar's pretty reasonable at trying to benefit from this in general um, because you'll have natural discarding cards like Mysterious Treasure, Viridian Forest, and a good amount of insta-playables. Um, but at the same time, having to shuffle back in cards that you don't really want to see, again, is also a little bit awkward. Yes, you can cherry pick the two that you keep, so you can keep a supporter for next turn or like a switch to get into a Stellar Wish or something, but that's still not ideal. I think the only reason I'm giving this more than one star is the synergy with Solgaleo and Lunala, whose GX attack is completely based around if you've played a Lily's Full Force during your turn. And uh, it's a really insane effect, the Light of Protector GX attack, if you do have... Um, a Lily's Full Force uh, played that turn. You prevent all effects of attacks, including damage, done to each of your Pokemon. So you basically have a free turn uh, against people. Uh, you can't be damaged and even effects as well. So you just completely nullify a turn from the opponent in terms of prize racing against you. And that's obviously a pretty huge deal. So it might be enough of a payoff to make a sort of um, Malamar deck work that's quite different to the Malamars that we're currently seeing. I'm a little bit sceptical, uh, which is why it's only a two-star, but I think it'll be experimented with for sure. Malo and Lana, another one of these uh, tag team supporters. I think it's got potential as well. It allows you to switch your active Pokemon with one of your benched, and also you can discard two cards from your hand. If you do, heal 120 from the new active Pokemon. I think a lot of people get confused with this uh, because it's healing the new Pokemon instead of the active, which is very strange. Usually you'd expect cards to heal like the active, um, so it's quite different to most supporter texts out there, but again, it seems like a decent card. I think the best thing that sort of draws me towards this card is, again, it's tag whistleable, and also it's just that you can have extra outs against Raichu Reset Stamp. I think Picaron steals a lot of wins these games, uh, where it's a little bit behind against some tag team decks, and it simply goes, well, I'm behind, I guess I'll Reset Stamp you to three, and paralyze you, and see if you can get into like your one or two of copies of Switch that all of the decks down here, the Mewtwo deck, the Guardian, the Reshizard, they all only play low counts of the Switches uh, physically. Now you can get away with that a little bit more, because you have the amount of tag whistles that you do in your deck, and that will always get you into a Mallow to get you switched out of the way. So it's another sort of get-out-of-jail-free card around paralysis and other status conditions. It doesn't feel all that strong in a vacuum. Like, you could also argue that this is just a worse version of Tate and Liza, because Tate and Liza can at least, like, shuffle and draw you five. Uh, but the upside is it's searchable through the whistles, so you just have a lot of outs to switch when you need it. And again, it might warrant a one-off slot in tag whistle-based builds. Misty and Lorelei, yet another tag team supporter. Um, it allows you to search your deck for three waters, reveal them and put them into your hand. So that's immediately worse than a lady. Um, but it also has this added effect that says you can discard five other cards from your hand. If you do, your water Pokemon can use their GX attack, even if you've already used your GX. So it essentially unflips your GX marker so that you're allowed to flip it again um, that turn. There's not that many good water GX attacks out there. The ones that I could sort of cherry pick are the ones like Resolute Blade from Akeldeo, and then like Bubble Launcher and Polispear can also reach like decent numbers. Um, so I think there's a big lack of good water Pokemon out there. Honestly, the only card I could genuinely see this uh, working in is the Akeldeo deck. Uh, just for a bit more aggression with Akeldeo using Resolute Blade over and over again. Overall, I don't think it's going to be that promising though. There's the potential for it to be in some sort of like combo deck where you use Palkia and Dialga alongside Keldeo and you try and use Misty and Lorelei in there as well so that you can like just Resolute Blade two times and if you've got the, um, if you've already used like the GX attack from Dialga Palkia, you're allowed to Resolute Blade more, which is pretty cool. Um, but I think that's about it. And it's also really combo-y. You have to discard five other cards from hand. So even if you have a six card hand, you go down to a four card hand on your own terms, which is super weird. So uh, yeah, I think this is pretty weak overall. We have Ends Resolve. Uh, the community are pretty hyped on this card. I'm only like mediocre on it. It's definitely a little bit powerful and people just see Reshiram and Zekrom and see it going immediately into that deck. But I don't think it's guaranteed to go into Reshiram. That's the only reason why I'm holding back from a higher rating. It allows you to discard the top six cards from your deck, attach all basic energy discarded in this way to one of your bench dragon Pokemon. Obviously, it harks back to Max Elixir. It was a crazy, crazy item card that gave your basic Pokemon extra acceleration. 
Ends is a very similar card in terms of what it's doing. It's basically two Stormy Winds in one supporter um, onto your Dragon types, which is pretty cool. Um, but it's a supporter at the end of the day, and most supporters right now need to draw you cards. Yes, we have a lot of Dedenne action going on, and you can draw a lot off of him, but at the same time, you want to get set up a lot of the time. And Ends Resolve doesn't really help us do that. It gets a bunch of energies in play, which helps for Fabled Flare Bolts, uh, which is the main attack from uh, Reshiram and Zekrom. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if this is enough. I don't know if it's better for us to just draw cards in general with other powerful supporters, possibly even Welder uh, for the active Reshiram, so he can attack with that quicker. Um, so I think if Ends does go into the Reshiram deck, it's not going to be as like a 4 of, it's going to be like a 1 or 2 of that you just kind of use here and there to activate the Crossbreak GX attack. Very similar to Lily's Full Force, where um, the Crossbreak GX synergizes with this supporter exactly. If you played the Ends Resolve that turn, um, you're able to do 170 to 2 of your opponent's Pokemon. Two 170 snipes is pretty insane. Um, obviously... We've seen uh, Full Blitz and Tag Bolt be a crazy combo in the format for a long time. Now Crossbreak GX can do that two times over, potentially, if you used Ends in the same turn, which is actually pretty insane. And I think there will be some combo-based builds of Reshiram that are trying to use this Ends Resolve to the full effect. Um, but I also think there'll be more straightforward builds of Reshiram which won't go down the Ends Resolve path at all and just go towards other synergistic cards like Welder, like Tapu Koko Prism Star, all that sort of stuff. So um, I don't think he's a guaranteed card in Reshiram. That's why he's not got a higher rating. But I do also have to note that he could could be a reasonable accelerator for a few other cards out there. Arceus, Dialga, and Palkia, another promising dragon-type tag team from this set. Uh, Turtonator also loves, of course, bursting energies into play for his own explosive jet attack. And, you know, we've seen Stormy Winds before. Why don't we just have more Stormy Winds in the form of Ends Resolve in sort of Turbo Rayquaza decks? That's a lot of discarding, though, so you probably end up decking yourself out a lot of the time and need to have some free cycle. Um, but yeah... N has some promising options, and I'm pretty sure he may end up like sneaking into Reshiram decks just to have the option to GX attack uh, for the full effect, because it's a very strong GX attack at the end of the day. Next up, we have Professor Oak Setting. Uh, it's a very cool supporter card, giving us some extra basic Pokemon Search, which is desperately needed in the format right now. It kind of harps back to Lynette's Net Search. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit worse because the Pokemon that you search go directly to your bench. Uh, but this allows you to get three basic Pokemon of different types. And this is obviously a huge effect. Um, you can use this with GX Pokemon, not only non-GXs, although the ones I've put on screen are, are only non-GX Pokemon. But the stipulation is that they have to be different types. This is a pretty big deal uh, for evolution decks. And you can really cheat this sort of negative text of Oak setting, thanks to Ditto Prism Star. Ditto Prism is basically in every evolution deck anyways, um, so you can just go ahead and grab your main Pokemon, a Ditto Prism Star, something like a Jirachi or like a different attacker that you go for, and that could be really huge. I've also noted that there are some evolution decks that we have in the format right now that already play two different types of the same basic. There are Water and Fighting Whoopers, for example. There's Psychic and Dark Inkes. So there's very easy ways that you can cheat the negative effect of Oak Setting to really give you insane search in the early turns. I don't think this guy's going to be in like every deck right now. Obviously, we have such great search for GX Pokemon and tag teams coming out. There's Cherish Ball and there's Tag Whistle that this guy has to compete with. But I think if any non-GX uh, like um, decks are going to function, it may well look towards Oak Setting because it's just such great and reliable search for us. And is far better than Professor Elm's Lecture in many ways because it has the added benefit of getting your initial attacker that you can physically attach to. One of the main reasons why Elm doesn't work in Malamar is because you can't get, you know, a Giratina and an Energy turn one. That's why you oftentimes go digging with Lilies and stuff just to hit more Bull Search cards so you can also get that Giratina attachment going. Now there's no longer that issue. And also this guy can go ahead and get Jirachi so that you can also have consistency for getting a supporter on the second turn. So I really think this is going to be a fantastic card for evolving decks and might breathe life into them for sure. We then have Red and Blue, another promising tag team supporter. Really is a big feature of this set. Um, it allows you to search your deck for a Pokemon GX that evolves from one of your Pokemon and put it onto that Pokemon to evolve it. So essentially the initial text is an Evo Soda. Um, and then we have the extra effect that allows you to discard two cards from your hand. If you do, search your deck for up to two basic energy and attach them to the Pokemon you evolved. So that's huge acceleration from the deck via a supporter. The last time we saw Acceleration um, from a supporter, 
in this form was kind of like Welder, right? It's attaching two and drawing three cards. Well, this is very comparable. You're attaching two and you're tutoring out a evolution, which is obviously insane. There's clear synergy here with Weavile GX because you can get your Weavile into play, get those energies, and then immediately start using Shadow Connection to move them around the board onto more relevant attackers, which is just incredible. I gave this guy the 4-star rating literally because I think it pushes Dark Box to at least a tier 2 archetype because now we can cut the Naggers from the Dark deck. You can just go down to a thicker Weavile line and have Red and Blue in here as your initial acceleration. You can still have B-Strings in the deck even without Naggers because there are some new options that we'll talk about later that you can use B-String with. So giving Dark Box a lot of different options is really, really awesome. There's a bunch of other Stage 1s that might also benefit from this. Um, obviously, this isn't only for Stage 1s. There are some Stage 2s out there that might want to benefit from this card, but I still think Stage 2s will struggle. Um, so I've mainly put Stage 1 options on here. I do believe that a Sylvalai Volcarona deck might be born from this set um, because Volcarona has the options of both Red and Blue and Welder to accelerate himself and his ability is incredible. Um, Aerodactyl is this card that could be really awesome with some extra energy acceleration. It's previously tried to go alongside Welder and have an awkward energy split. Now you can go down the red and blue route instead and really clear things up in that regard. And there's also Glaceon GX. There's some good evolution support from this set. Glaceon's ability is still very frustrating and pushing um, the evolutions with a bunch of other stage ones as well as red and blue to accelerate the frost bullet and polar spear GX could be really awesome as well. So don't sleep on Glaceon. It might be creeping back into the format thanks to red and blue. We then have Roller Skater. I believe this is a pretty weak supporter overall. You get to discard a card from hand. If you do, draw two. If it's an energy, you get to drew, uh, draw two more cards. So um, it's basically an engineer's adjustments, but has that little bit of extra flexibility to it that allows you to discard one and draw two at the very least if you don't have an energy. Obviously, there's some synergy with discarding energy cards. Uh, we know that like, Psychic Energy love going to the discard pile. Lightning Energy in some uh, Picaron decks if it's early on with Tapu Koko. Uh, fire Energies don't mind hitting the bin just because of things like Victini Prism and Fiery uh, Fire Crystal, stuff like that. So there's obviously some discard options that we can have here that you know, energies don't mind hitting the bin in certain decks, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's all that consistent, and we have better options out there. Like, it competes with TV Reporter. TV Reporter's always live for a draw three to discard one, and you get to draw three first, so if you draw any duds, you can then just discard that one first anyway. And I think the biggest deal is that it competes with Cynthia and Caitlyn. If any of these decks want to have a synergistic card, you can have Cynthia and Caitlyn, which draws you three and gets you a supporter back guaranteed, so... Roller Skater only drawing four and giving you no guarantees of a good turn next turn is kind of blown out the water by Cynthia and Caitlin that's doing that discard one, draw three, and make sure you have a good turn next turn by picking back a different supporter card from your discard pile. So I really think Roller Skater has just been beaten out by the other options that we have in the format right now. Rosa is a really cool supporter that I'm hoping pushes, once again, non-GXs into being more relevant threats in the format. The reason why I mention non-GX, although this doesn't state non-GX Pokemon, is that you have so many more options to use Rosa throughout the game if you're a non-GX deck. And uh, Rosa is only live if one of your Pokemon was knocked out during your opponent's last turn. So it reads very similarly to teammates in that initial text, but instead of getting two of any card, you can go ahead, search your deck for a Pokemon, a trainer, and a basic energy, reveal them, and put them into your hand. This is really nice. Uh, obviously, there's some very, very powerful trainers that we have access to right now. Rare Candy is obviously a huge one for Stage 2 decks. Rosa is going to be a godsend for those. Uh, but also things like Reset Stamp for disrupting the opponent, as well as Great Catcher, an amazing new trainer card that we get from this set, can all be picked out by Rosa at the same time you're getting, hopefully, backup energies to attack with, as well as backup attackers that you can keep putting into play and replacing your non-GXs. Um, I mentioned that it could still go in GX decks. I don't really think it's that good in GX decks, because GXs never really struggle getting Pokemon out because of Cherish Ball. Um, trainers are fairly easy to come by just by using other powerful supporters. So I believe Rosa will pretty much be shoehorned into non-GX decks only. But I do think there are some very promising non-GX decks out there. Um, Spiritomb's kind of on the fringes right now. Getting a card like this could really help give it a push. Um, there's also some promising other non-GX decks that I'll be discussing later, which I believe warrants Rosa being a four-star just because of its versatility. It's going to end up somewhere, and it'll end up being like a focal point for that deck, even if it is just like a three copy rather than four because it's not live on those opening turns. It's still going to be a really big include for some non-GX decks in my opinion. Roxy is an interesting supporter again. 
It allows you to discard up to two Pokemon cards from your hand, excluding GX or EX. For each you discarded, draw three cards from your deck. <coughs> so straight away, because it can't discard GXs or EXs, it's a lot less versatile than you'd like it to be, because a lot of decks out there right now are very heavily based on GXs. Um, but it has some pretty big potential upside thanks to a wheezing and coughing that we have in this set. Uh, that once discarded by Roxy, they do 10 to all of your opponent's uh, Pokemon in play. So it's essentially like a big version of Fukui. The massive upside being if you discard, say, two Coughings, you can do draw six and do essentially up to 120 damage uh, because you do 10 to a full board of your opponent twice over which is absolutely incredible. It's really a huge power creep on Kakui, but it's very, very combo-based, and I think that's what really puts me off here. There's plenty of opportunities for you to whiff the right targets, and Roxy getting rid of other Pokemon isn't all that strong. Yes, it still draws you cards, but um, it's not all that valuable, and it's not that great. It's basically like using Ultra Conversion uh, with a bit more flexibility, but again, only really decks that aren't playing heavy GXs that can benefit from this. So I'm guessing this is kind of pigeonholed towards some psychic spread-based variants. Possibly something like a Catterday deck could end up having. Something like Coughing and Wheezing in here. We've seen Gengar start to pop up recently. That could give, uh, well, gain a big push just from having more damage from Roxy. Because if you're able to cycle these Wheezings and Coughings, um, Roxy is going to be giving you a lot of damage. I said 120, and that's basically just from your opponent having a full board and using one Roxy. So if you are able to use this a couple times over for the full value with the coughings and wheezings, you can get a lot of damage in play. I wouldn't underestimate the supporter if someone can get the combo to work. It's just I don't see how consistently you can Roxy for full value or even half value a lot of the time. Um, especially if you're just needing to draw cards in general. It feels like one of these cards that's great if your hand is already like 10 cards deep and uh, you can do whatever you want with Roxy. But then... It doesn't seem that great from there. Um, this could also breathe life into something like a Weezing archetype. Uh, we've seen Detention Gas be very annoying in the past. Obviously, it doesn't have many good attachment options available to it right now, just triple accelerations and possibly something like Welder uh, to get Weezings rolling quickly. But having this extra influx of damage, now you can change all your coughings to be quote-unquote good coughings, and even just having like one of the other Weezing in your deck um, means that if you have enough Pokemon Recycle in the build, especially thanks to Lana's Fishing Rod, something coming out from this set, um, you could have some extra damage on your hands that can really give the deck more burst that it desperately requires right now. So um, don't sleep on Roxy. I think there are some combos here, but it is definitely a combo card. I don't think she's good enough in her own right if you're not discarding Coughing and Weezings. There's definitely better supporters out there, so you have to commit a lot of deck space to make this card strong, and that's my biggest reservation about her. Will is our final supporter on the list. Um, it allows you to, um, the first time you flip a coin after paying this guy, uh, for a trainer, an ability, or an attack during this turn, you may choose to make the result heads or tails. So essentially, you're manipulating the coin flip to be in your favor, and I don't think that's that good. I mean, if you play a super scoop up and willed before that, it's basically an Acer Roller in two cards. If you did a Crushing Hammer, uh, after a will, you're basically doing a team flag run, but with a two card combo. And both those things are bad because will is only ever comboing off other things. Uh, so it requires you to already have a lot of other stuff in hand. Will's not helping you draw towards any of those. So it's a very slow card in general. So that leads me to believe that will be will be pretty poor. There's an Exartu in this set as well that can do um, on a coin flip, uh, put you down to 10 hit points remaining or put the opponent's active down to 10 hit points remaining which could be a pretty cool meme deck with like shrines or spell tags or other things here and there uh, but overall i don't think it's going to be that strong will is just a pretty slow card in my opinion onto the trainers and we start off with a doozy possibly the most important card to note from this set great catcher is going to hugely impact the game uh, we've had this small period where Gust has been pretty limited. We've got the custom catcher combos. We've got Nine Temptations, which has been incredible for us and has made Fire Decks really high on the tier list just because they have that option. And a Victory Bell, which no one's used. Uh, but Great Catcher comes in and really is salvation for a lot of archetypes. It allows you to discard two cards from your hand and then switch one of your opponent's Pokemon GX or EX with their active. So... That's incredible. It only targets GXs and DXs as well, which I personally love for the game um, because it, again, helps push non-GX decks. It means that 
Um, people trying to set up stage twos and stuff in the back, they're not just going to get grinched by people. And it means that, in general, the game is still going to be able to flow. Many of these archetypes that currently are playing customs can buy themselves some deck space and also just have more options to gust the Denes for prize racing. Oftentimes that's going to be the case. Or just in general, being able to gust up Pokemon uh, that people are trying to power up in the back. Definitely some of these green decks will try and go for that sort of approach. Um, things like Weldering or Fairy Songing to the Benched Guy. Now we can great catch them up very, very consistently. So I really do think the game is going to be changing in a big way. A lot of archetypes out there right now will be adapting so that they can gust up to Denes and just win prize races. I, again, think this is a huge push for non-GX decks in general um, because reaching 160 is not that difficult and gaining that advantage is such a big deal. I think non-GX decks are struggling for a bunch of reasons right now, but one of them is that they have to make space for four custom catchers and have engines that work for custom catcher and a lot of the time they can only really gust a Dene once and that's just too difficult for them. Now with great catcher in their lists they can really be rewarded for being single prizes and up trading on tag team and other decks so I really do think great catcher is an amazing card for the game. It's been balanced well by only being able to target GX's so both players are fully aware of the risk of them using the Dene or uh, whatever deck they're playing. I think it will um, push Custom Catcher out of many, many builds, um, but I do still think Ninetales will stick around. I think Ninetales is just about a good enough card because it has that extra flexibility in decks. But in general, this is going to end up being like a three or four of in a bunch of decks. Um, and if you're a greens based deck, you may only need to play like two copies of this card, but then you buy some deck space that you had from custom catchers, and that can also be really awesome. So you can have extra tech cards or extra consistency. So great catcher is going into basically everything that isn't playing nine tails and could even just overtake ability Zard to just play uh, great catchers as well, because nine tails are still a good amount of deck space. You can play less energy cards or less fire crystals as well now. And that's just amazing for you. So this card is an all-round five-star, very, very easy pick, and is going to be in everything. Lana's Fishing Rod is a pretty nice item. Again, <coughs> like I was saying with Gust and how limited options we've had, the format has definitely been calling out for a card like this. You're able to shuffle a Pokemon and a tool from your discard pile into your deck. Currently, we only have Brock's Grit to go off of to try and recover Pokemon. Finally, we have the Fishing Rod that can come in as a trainer and help us out. Yes, it's pretty slow because it's shuffling these cards back into the deck um, and it's only doing one target, but I still think this is a pretty big deal and may end up being shoehorned into a handful of decks. Even if it is just a one or two of copy, it's still pretty nice. Things like Malamar getting back, uh, like early Inkes or Malamars that have been knocked out as well as extra spell tags is a pretty big deal. Also, it means you can feel a lot more confident getting rid of things like Espeon Deoxys or Esper, and you can recover them with Lana's Fishing Rod, which could be absolutely awesome for spread Malamar-based decks. Spiritomb also wants to get back its Hustle Belts all the time, and it also means that you can have tech cards like Hooper and stuff in the Spiritomb deck, and if you're up against a Malamar, you can start Fishing Rodding him back without actually having to commit like three deck spaces to Hoopers just for one matchup. Now you can have the Fishing Rod, and it's just an all-round good card that also helps out uh, when you're in those situations, which is just really awesome uh, for the deck in general. Things like Ability Zard have a lot of one ofs as well. Uh, the Baby Blown, the Turtonator, the Heatran, these are all recoverable. And you have the upside of getting back things like a skateboard as well for your Jirachis if you need to. And um, same thing for things like Pika Rom. Um, we've seen recently Pedro playing a three non GX combo of Zapdos, Hooper, and Electros in his uh, Pika Rom list just so he can fight other non GX matchups. Well, now having a fishing rod, you can sort of go around that the same way, and you have like a Vulcan searchable way of getting back Pokemon into your deck immediately to sort of search them back out and start swinging with them. So I really do think Lana's fishing rod is versatile and strong, and it's definitely going to be an option in a handful of decks. I don't think it's guaranteed in anything, once again, but it's just one of these cards that will end up going into play, uh, into decks as a one-off a lot of the time. I'm going to take a quick sip of water because I'm already talking way too much. As we move into Lily's Clefairy Doll, this is a very nice upgrade to RoboSub. RoboSub was a really awesome uh, trainer card that really um, gave a breath of life to a handful of archetypes throughout its um, sort of reign in the format. It made Domfan a very good deck. It was used in Groudon to buy yourself time. It was used in things like Quad Regirock builds as well and expanded at points as well, which is just really awesome. And it's even better than RoboSub. It is a 30 hit point colorless basic when you put the trainer down and any time during your turn you can put this card to the bottom of your deck 
and discard all the cards attached to it. This is where it's a lot better than Robosub. Robosub isn't allowed to retreat. Uh, same thing for this Clefairy doll. But if you wanted to move your Robosub out of the active, you would have to discard Robosub. Now Clefairy doll goes straight back to the bottom of your deck, so it's able to be used again. So that's a really huge deal. And I think we have a couple of decent hit and run options in the format right now that would definitely will be pushing Lily's Clefairy doll to be a very relevant card. Um, when this card is knocked out, your opponent can't take any prize cards. That's the biggest deal. So things like the Mysterious Noise, Behem uh, deck is going to be pretty awesome. Previously, it used things like a Lolan Ninetales to be a wall or Gumi to deny the opponent prizes, like crossing their fingers, hoping that people can't get set up enough under item lock that they can start taking prizes. Now having four Lily's Clefairy Doll buys you a lot of turns, potentially, to reuse that Mysterious Noise as often as possible, get yourself set up, and hopefully get you ahead in a prize race, which is a pretty big deal, because essentially you waste four turns from the opponent if you have a full four copies of the doll in your deck, which is really, really good for you. Um, I also think there might be a new Sourcebuck archetype coming out from this set, uh, which is doing the same thing. Sourcebuck has a hit and run attack that just does 60 for two and switches to the bench. Um, I believe that could be comboed alongside Florgus. Florgus allows you to flip a coin each turn, and if heads you get an item from your discard pile on top of your deck. The Sourcebuck allows you to draw a card every turn as well. So you could just, whenever a Lily's Clefairy doll gets knocked out, you can try and flip for Wondrous Gift to get a Florgus to get the doll back. Then you draw into it thanks to the Sourcebuck ability, put down the doll, and then do another hit and run attack with the Sourcebuck and put the Clay, uh, Clefairy doll back in the active. So I think that's a pretty gross and ugly combo. Definitely one of the early decks that I want to try out. I think it's very, very strong. Uh, although it is quite a big setup deck, the Sourcebuck can at least draw you cards. The Florgus doesn't have to hit the field until late on anyway, just because it's trying to recover Clefairy Dolls that have already been knocked out. So I think the archetype will have time, and especially if people go away from Custom Catchers and go away from um, Ninetales, Sourcebuck could really um, be an annoying deck to play around, very similar to old Domfan, basically. Speaking of Domfan, uh, we've seen Hitmonchan be the expanded version of Domfan, uh, using wobs and robo subs and all that stuff. Well, they could try and do the same thing in standard as well uh, with these Clefairy dolls. Again, you could even try the Florgus um, deck or like the combo with the Hitmonchan deck as well. Um, you don't have that extra option of drawing into your Clefairy doll that you recover straight away, but it can still be a reasonable option. So I really do think this doll breathes life into hit and run. One of my favorite um, ways to play the game is hit and run style decks. Um, I've played them for a long time and I really do like seeing this card back in the format because I think it's a pretty cool option. Here's the Tag Whistle. I mentioned him a bunch of times uh, with all those supporters that you're now seeing on screen. And this card is incredible. Easy five-star card, completely nuts. Uh, it's a hugely powerful trainer that really helps tag team decks as if they needed any more support. Here they go. You get to search your deck for up to two tag team cards and put them into your hand, then shuffle your deck. That means you can go ahead, search your deck for your backup Guard of our Sylveon, as well as a... Uh, Guzma and Haller or Caitlyn and Cynthia all in one go. So Tag Whistle is early search and consistency, which is absolutely nuts in those opening turns. It really reminds me of Holland Transceiver. There used to be a bunch of decks out there that had Holland engines because it based all around of this Holland Transceiver item card that allowed you to cherry pick the right supporters for the right times that had Holland in their name. Very, very similar to the Tag Whistle. Um, if you play four copies of Tag Whistle, it's like playing four Cherish Ball in Guardian. But you get to now pick, you know, Mallow and Lana if you need to switch out the active on the right turn. You can play that Guzma for the early, like, power plant combos and getting your tool down early. And in general, you can go ahead and get Caitlyn and Cynthia, which can then recover you greens for future turns whilst also digging you deeper into the deck and definitely being a better version of um, the Coach Trainer, which is seeing a lot of play in Guardian currently. So I think the Tag Whistle completely blows out of the water and goes straight into... Guardian, I think it goes into uh, Dark decks as well, because Dark will be playing uh, Red and Blue to get the Weavile out, and you want to Tag Whistle to find Dark Ryan Umbreon, possibly even um, your Tyranitar Sableye as well. You can go ahead and grab those guys off the Tag Whistle. I think there'll be Greens-based builds of the Charizard deck, updated with Charizard and Breaks in as well, and also Tag Whistle is probably going to go into Mewtwo, just because it can also get you means of switching with Mallow and Lana, as well as getting you Caitlyn and Cynthia, which I think is a reasonable card that you can weave in. Um, it has discard synergy. It gets you more welders. That's very good. Uh, we've seen Mewtwo playing Mind Report 
the bench space is a little bit awkward. Now you can go ahead and Caitlyn and Cynthia on your like quote unquote off turns where you're not weldering to just get you back a welder and also draw three cards and have discard synergy. So yeah, uh, the tag engine is unreal. I think it's going to see play in a whole bunch of different decks. Tag teams get even more support. It's pretty crazy. Beastite is the first tool that we'll be talking about today. It um, does 10 damage more um, for each prize card you've taken, but you can only attach this to... Well, you can. Uh, it only works for Ultra Beast. You only get the additional benefit off of Ultra Beast. So this is pretty awesome. Uh, we've seen how powerful things like Choice Band, Muscle Band have been in the past. This is basically a Ultra Beast only card uh, that gives you that sort of effect and really gives you a snowball effect. If you start winning with your Ultra Beast, start taking prizes early... The B start is going to help you push through to the late game and be a pretty powerful option. Um, my sort of question mark is what specific deck it goes in. Uh, probably goes in the Naga Chess deck, I would say. Uh, one thing Naga Chess has never really been very good at is knocking out non jexes because Beast Raid isn't that good for damage. So having Beast Knight to make Beast Raid a more viable attack in the early game could definitely be an option for pressure, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't think Bocephalon will play it simply because we get an insane tool for Blounds in this set anyways, uh, but it could be like a late game option. Um, Ultra Necrozma used to play Choice Band in the past um, and definitely could benefit from Beastite. It might make it much more relevant because it can push uh, Photon Geyser into needing one less energy against tag teams, which is definitely pretty cool. Um, and also Buzzmosa, that Beast Game GX, never forget how strong that attack can be. Um, at cheesing ways to end the game quicker, at knocking out things like um, Jirachis and whatnot, or all sorts of things. Now that the doors are opened with Beastite, you can do so much more damage uh, off of one energy Beast Game GX. If you combine this with Beast Energy as well, man, this Buzzmosa is going to be able to knock out all sorts of things to close the game. And we even have things like Great Catcher, so if you put prior damage on um, other attackers or whatever, Beast Game can definitely mop up and take a bunch of prizes all at once. So, there are some options for Beastite. I'm just not certain what archetype um, we have in the format right now that really wants to use this to great effect. I'm not certain if there's enough um, that can really take full advantage of this card. It's very, very strong in a vacuum. It's just so limited to the decks that we have available right now uh, that actually want to use the card. <coughs> Here's the other um, uh, tool card we get from the set. Island Challenge Amulet is certainly a strong card. The max hit points of the Pokemon GX or EX this card is attached to is reduced by 100. And if this Pokemon is knocked out by damage from the attacks of your opponent's Pokemon, they take one less prize card. So it reads very similarly to Life Do. Do bear in mind that the Challenge Amulet only works on damage. Um, so if people are, you know, poisoning you for knockouts or if they're using like damage placements instead for knockouts, that amulet won't work. But in most situations, this Challenge Amulet is insane. It turns your GX glass cannons into non-GX glass cannons. And I think you already know which card I'm talking about. Blacephalon could really, really enjoy having uh, an island amulet attached because it could sometimes offer up two turns of B-string. That's unreal. It gives you just so many more options to hit your combo and work. One of the main reasons why people are put off the Cephalon is basically the B-string turn comes around, you've only got one turn, and if your hand's not good, you can't capitalize, and the entire deck just sort of flops. If you have an Island Amulet on the Blacephalon, uh, it means that even if that guy gets knocked out, if you've not taken full value from your B-strings, or if you still have like one or two B-strings left in the deck, and a Blacephalon gets knocked out for only one prize, you very often will have another turn of B-string, which is obviously very, very good for you. And... Because you're just a linear racing deck, putting the challenge amulet on, like you don't care that you're an 80 hit point Blacephalon, you're just trying to be a glass cannon and take big knockouts, which is really awesome. Another thing I'll note is that it could be good once again in tag team decks. We've seen Tord Reklev play uh, Shedinja in things like his Mewtwo deck as of late, and uh, this is a similar concept. Obviously, the Shedinja keeps your tanky hit points around, but in a pure prize race, this could be a pretty good deal for you. Um, so that you force your opponent to go through three tag teams rather than two. Um, and it means, again, you can kind of be glass cannony with some of your attacks. Obviously, Mewtwo can use all sorts of other attacks in the game right now to do huge damage. And uh, there may be a handful of other decks. Even Green's archetypes could end up putting one uh, Island Amulet in the list. Um, just so that when 
you know, it forces your opponent to have taken five prizes and then you can start stamp comboing them and it gets really rough. So I could see this ending up in things like uh, Greenzard and Charizard breaks in as well, just because you're going to make the opponent go through an extra tag team, uh, which is also pretty gross. So I think there's a lot of potential for this card. Even if it ends up being like a one-of in certain green stacks, I also think this could easily just be like a two-of in Blacephalon, but an impactful enough card that I think definitely deserves a high rating and has to be respected a lot because... Glass cannoning in the TCG is like always very, very good. Uh, just up trading on things naturally is how you win games a lot of the time. So this card is excellent for doing that. Chaotic Swell is also a very powerful uh, stadium card. Very different to most stadiums you'd expect uh, because it basically doesn't give you any advantage. It's just trying to be a pure disruption based stadium. Uh, whenever either player plays a new stadium card from their hand to discard this stadium, discard this new stadium as well so essentially you put this card in proactively and then your first opponent's stadium does nothing basically it swallows up the stadium that they're trying to use to replace the stadium so it will leave the field with no stadium in play if this gets bounced and if you're the one replacing stadium from the opponent say they've got a power plant in play you can put the swell in and then if they're going to try and replace the power plant again to disrupt you that gets gobbled up and obviously your opponent can only play one stadium a turn so it means that you're free from power plant for a turn or free from lysander labs for a turn and i think that's huge for a lot of different archetypes out there things like guardian hate seeing lysander labs from pika roms and all sorts of archetypes even mewtwo's playing lysander labs sometimes if you play like one chaotic swell uh, it means that the two labs that Picarom is currently playing is pretty nullified, right? You bounce the first labs with the Swell, and then the Swell can gobble up the other Lysander labs, and suddenly your tools are safe. Shedinja, again, hates seeing Lysander labs, one of its biggest counters out there right now. If you play Chaotic Swell in your deck, and obviously you can recycle Chaotic Swell with Oranguru, you'll easily win out the Stadium War and then not be worried about labs for the rest of the game. Any deck that plays Jirachi, also fearful of labs, you can just put Chaotic Swell down, knowing that you can Stellar Wish easily with your Escape Boarded Jirachi the following turn. Power Plant decks. How scared is Mewtwo of Chaotic of uh, Power Plant? As we all know, Stamp Plant is a vicious combo that a lot of decks are scared of. Anything playing Dedenne could also consider playing Chaotic Swell, just for that exact reason. Um, there's all these greens decks out there trying to Stamp Plant and hope that that's good enough uh, to sort of carry them back into the game. And now you can put the Swell into play, and they just can't do that. They can stamp you, sure, but then you still have all your outs to Dedenne, which is really insane. Also, a scary side note is that this is really annoying for Keldeo decks. They can get around Power Plant much easier, so it could also bring about Quad Keldeo. Um, <coughs> I've already mentioned the crazy Misty and Lorelei card, uh, but in more seriousness, there's things like the Arceus Palkia Dialga, which could really help out Keldeo because um, it allows it to do more damage and take more prizes when it takes knockouts. So uh, the combination of Chaotic Swell plus the new tag team could see Quad Keldeo decks becoming more relevant for sure. And even if you're not playing one of these decks that's playing or like is very scared of labs or very scared of power plants, you're still just disrupting some key support, uh, st key stadium cards in the game. Uh, Picarom very often gets turn 2 full blitz thanks to the help of Stadium Nav for Thunder Mountain. So proactively putting down a Chaotic Swell against them is going to be horrible. And many, many fire decks out there are very reliant on Giant Hearth, so they can have Welder activation and also shuts down that Ninetales from being able to gust. So all round Chaotic Swell is in a point in the game where Stadiums are very strong and is going to be hugely disruptive. I feel like this card may be a one-of in all sorts of decks. I think it's very, very versatile, and is basically always a consideration if your deck is scared of Power Plant or Labs, or just wants to disrupt another deck that has a really powerful stadium uh, that is otherwise a hard matchup for you. So this Swell is an insane, insane stadium card. Draw Energy is a special energy that provides colorless, but when you attach it, from your hand, you may draw a card. Very, very simple text, but actually pretty powerful. Um, my biggest sort of downside with this card is there aren't enough Pokemon in the game right now that have like colorless attack costs. Um, so I don't think there are many cards that can take full advantage of this. I mentioned how Guzma and Hala in some tag team decks might be able to weave in like one or two copies of Draw Energy. I think Guardian specifically might weave in like two copies of this card maximum, um, just so that you can do turn one Tag Whistle for Guzma Hala Get yourself a draw energy plus a fairy charm plus a um, uh, power plant or whatever. That could be pretty gross. So I feel like draw energy could weave its way into a handful of decks, but there ultimately aren't enough colorless attackers out there right now. 
One thing I will note as well is that if there is colourless attackers out there, or attackers with one colourless in their attack cost, things like Giratina that have added Recycle Energy, that's the problem, right? They have to compete with Recycle. So is drawing a card better than guaranteeing an energy back every single time it gets knocked out? And you have to sort of decide for yourself which is better. One thing I'll note as well, though, it's extra Porygon Z, crazy code madness, and fun shenanigans on that front, giving that deck potentially more consistency as well. So definitely something to bear in mind. Right now, there aren't many decks that spring to my head um, that could really benefit from this outside of Guardian if they're playing a Guzma Hala, uh, as part of their early Tag Whistle engine, so I think it's super niche, that's why I've only given it a 2 star rating. On to the Pokemon now, we start off with the Grass types, and we kick off with Buzzwall, it's a uh, 130 hit point Grass type Ultra Beast, non-GX, weak to fire, 2 retreat, with that Beast Burst ability. This Pokemon's attacks do 20 more damage to your opponent's active for each prize card you have taken. So it reads very similarly to that Beast Knight, right? The Beast Knight does 10 more for each prize card you've taken, and this ability does 20 more. So if you combine the two, you're doing 30 damage more for each prize card you've taken throughout the entire game. Unfortunately, Touchdown isn't that strong. Uh, for a Grass and Colorless, you do 60 and heal 30 from this guy. So the heal is pretty much irrelevant because you're so weak anyways. And 60 is such bad vanilla output that even with the help of Beast Knight and Beast Burst, um... At the best of times, you're still not knocking out much, so I personally think this is a little bit weak. It's also a 2 energy. I think if Touchdown was on 1 energy, it'd be a different story. He could be a good finisher that could just, like, gust the Dene and win the game. Uh, but as it stands right now, you've got a beast ring to him, basically, uh, or have some, like, random counter gain stuff. So I think he's pretty weak. Um, I don't think it really makes anything like a Greens Buzzmosa work much better. It could just be, like, a non gex that you put in that deck. Um, just to skew the prize trade a little bit and be like an annoying wall that can do decent damage, especially if you've gone early aggression with like your first Buzzmosa. Similar to how um, essentially Reshizard plays a couple Volks just to be awkward single prizes. This guy could sort of fill that role, but ultimately I don't think that's all that strong. And the Buzzmosa deck as a sort of quad greens build is just kept in place by welders anyway. Sourcebuck is that card that I mentioned earlier with Lily's Clefairy Doll. Let's talk about him in a bit more detail now and how I picture that deck working. The community don't see the same thing I do, I guess, uh, but I'm hopeful that this archetype will be strong. I know that Hit and Run has been great in the past, and we currently don't have any like supporter means of gusting, and the main gusting is going to be in the form of Great Catcher, which only ever works on GXs. So in my head, here's how it's going to go. We're going to try and get some Sourcebuck into play. We have netballs to help us on that approach, and this guy is a stage one that allows us to draw a card each time. Uh, well, each turn, he stays around, so the longer Swordsbuck stays in play, the better. And we have this attack that says bounce. You do 60 for a grass colorless and switch to the bench. Uh, very, very simple. The damage isn't impressive. Nothing's that impressive about this card, except for the fact that we're going to be spamming Lily's Clefairy Doll. Your opponent can't take a prize. They have to hit into this guy, and you're going to try and use Florgus, also building up in the back. Even if you just play something like a 2 2 2 line or a 2 0 2 line with two rare candies, uh, you're going to try and get Wondrous Gift rolling for you. Obviously, you have Rosa that can also pick out those rare candies, bear in mind. Uh, that does work off of um, Clefairy Doll, by the way, because it's a Pokemon getting knocked out. Um, you can then use Wondrous Gift to recycle that Clefairy Doll. Then the Season's Blessings draws into that Clefairy Doll again. And then you put down the Clefairy Doll and simply bounce back into the doll. So it's going to be a loop deck. Um, kind of similar to how Domfan Florgus tried to work previously, where Domfan Florgus was trying to, like, ma uh, sorry, last chance potion the entire time um, to win the game. Now we're trying to use Florgus with Clefairy Doll the whole time. I think this deck could be pretty decent. Um, I think it might be kept down by Bahiam builds of Clefairy Doll. Um, but I think ultimately it's pretty setup reliant and you're a little bit worried and might have to play something like Stealthy Hood to get around um, Ninetales. But as long as everyone moves away from Great Catcher, I feel like this archetype could super thrive. And even if people are playing customs, um, it's very very rare that they'll be able to take enough prizes um, because of the non-GX nature of this build. So I think this archetype is low-key, pretty powerful, and is one that's a little bit sketchy to play around for sure. I think this card is pretty cool, and I'm sure a lot of people haven't seen the same sort of lines that I've seen. Uh, I've tried to look at decks uh, already for this format, and I think this one could be pretty reasonable for sure. I'm willing to uh, bet that this may be a flop, though. Definitely one of the ones where I'm kind of reaching with this deck and trying to make something of it, but I definitely think there's something to be explored here. 
Tangrowth um, is another promising stage one that has the Grass Knot attack. For 10, uh, you get to do 30 more for each uh, colorless in the retreat cost of your opponent's active Pokemon. So you're naturally going to combine this with Absol. The colorless attack cost in the Tangrowth is actually pretty helpful. It means you could play Draw Energy uh, in one of these archetypes, and you can also play Recycle Energy. So this is an archetype that could definitely just get away with playing like 7 energy total with a mixture of Recycle and um, Draw Energy, which is pretty cool. Uh, you also have Netball available, so maybe you'd play like one or two Grass Energies just because it's searchable. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, you're obviously going to try and increase the retreat cost of basics with this Absol. Um, you'd have to play Power Plant so that you can get around um, Zero Aura. Um, but the idea is if you have a bunch of Absols in play, you can see that the damage does start racking up for a non-GX. And this guy's a pretty tanky one as well, 140. So it probably will force a lot of commitment from the opponent. And naturally having a bunch of Absols in your deck is just going to shut down the option for Jirachi a lot of the time, which is pretty cool. You naturally just become a bit of a disruptive deck if you're playing Power Plant and Absol in your list anyways. So just doing relatively decent damage uh, off of these attacks seems pretty good. Obviously when you come up against um, things that aren't basics, Absol is useless and your deck is pretty useless. So that's the reason why I've only given it a one star, because I think there will be more than just the tag team archetypes out there. But if there are enough decks that are just tag team based, this Tangrowth could end up being like a reasonable, disruptive, non-GX build. So I wouldn't be super surprised to see it do a little bit better than I'm expecting here. But the biggest deal is you need to get a bunch of Absols into play. That's not very easy. That eats up all your bench space. Um, it means you probably can't play your own Jirachi engine. Or if you do, you're sacrificing Dark Ambition here and there. So yeah, I think it's a little bit clunky overall. Venusaur and Snivy is our first GX that we get to talk about. It's a tag team that has 270 hit points. It's a grass type, weak to fire, oh boy. Uh, and it has a three retreat cost. It has the ability Shining Vine uh, once during your turn. If this Pokemon is your active Pokemon and you attach a grass energy from your hand to it, you get to switch one of your opponent's bench Pokemon with the active. So it's another form of gusting. I think this just comes at the wrong time because we're getting great catcher in this set anyways. That like pre Great Catcher, I definitely consider this card to be like pretty strong, uh, just because of how like bad having to use custom catchers has been this entire time. Um, but this is equally kind of bad, right? You need to have energies. You need to already be playing Grass Energy or at least something like Rainbow or Unit, and you also need to play a bunch of switches because this guy's so chunky that you can't use anything like uh, U-turn Ball to get him out of the way. The other alternative is that you actually attack with this guy. Uh, Forest Dump does 160, so it can at least gust up to Dene's and just simply knock them out a bunch. So trying to play like a big healing Venusaur archetype, how we've seen uh, Celesaur in the past. Uh, maybe we just play uh, Venusaur Snivy in a very similar shell and try and go about our business that way and just say that we're going to keep people honest by grinching the Dene's this entire time with Forest Dump. Ultimately, I don't think it's all that strong. And it would probably need to play some wacky engine like Welders. And if you're playing Welder, why aren't you playing a fire deck? <laughs> Basically is my entire hypothesis here. Obviously this guy's weak to fire, so it's going to have that issue the entire time. So I think ultimately this is probably going to be a bit of a flop. It does have the Solar Plant GX attack. You do 50 to each of your opponent's Pokemon. Uh, if the Pokemon has at least two extra energy, in addition, uh, you get to heal all damage from all of your Pokemon. Now, I first of all thought that because this is an all colorless attack cost, doing 50 to each of your opponent's Pokemon isn't that bad. And if you have extra spread already, this can end up being a finisher in some archetypes. I even thought about this being a finisher over Ultra Necrozma in something like a Malamar deck. Um, we've seen how SBDO could be a finisher um, because he can do that 100 damage spread a lot of the time. Uh, you can play Venusaur Snivy in Malamar decks if you've done your spell tag damage um, properly. You can Solar Plant and just knock out a whole bunch of things all at once. So there's the random outside chance that uh, Venusaur Snivy ends up in Malamar <laughs> as hit, as the option to gust things, uh, but I really don't think that'll be the case. So yeah, um, I've really tried my best to see where Celesaur, oh, sorry, where Venusaur Snivy will fit in, but ultimately I just don't see it. Valpium GX is a pretty poor stage two. Um, obviously again, grass type weak to fire, so already uh, that's a really bad black mark against his name. Uh, it has the Fragrant Flower Garden ability. Once during your turn, you may heal 30 from each of your Pokemon. We've seen this ability on a Gardevoir previously for 20. It never really did anything. Big Bloom does 180 for two energies, 10 less for each damage counter on this guy. So maybe you try and have like a tanking archetype, but who the hell tanks with 240 hit points these days? And Allergy Bomb GX for a Grass is 50. Your opponent's active is Poison, Burnt, and Paralyzed, so it's 80. 
essentially, and trying to paralyze stuff, but it's really not worth it for a stage two. Next up, we have a very promising tag team in Charizard and Brakeson GX. 270 hit points, fire type tag team that has the brilliant flare attack. For three fire, one colorless, you do 180. And I bet already you're saying, like, why would you play this over flare strike? It's 50 less base damage. Well, here's the reason. Would you trade 50 damage for being able to search your deck for up to three cards and put them straight into your hand? I would argue a lot of the time, yes. Brilliant Flare already sounds intensely good. Um, 180 is good enough numbers to knock out Dedenes. I always have to mention that these days because we're going to be in a great catch of formats. Killing Dedenes is going to be like the, the staple of the format from now on, basically. Brilliant Flare doing that is going to be awesome. And scouting three cards means that this deck can have a lot of control over what you do. Either you can go down some like healing routes with trying to grab things like Tag Switch and Super Scoop Ups. Um, you can guarantee yourself the next welder, which is always pretty good. Um, or you could be trying to gather some handlock combos. We've seen how Pidgeotto Control can really benefit from Surge, Stamp, Mars, Jesse James. Well, if you're able to tutor these cards, just how Magical Ribbon used to back in the day, um, you could tutor that combo out. And at one point, yes, you might fall behind. The first Charizard breaks and may get knocked out. But then you go Surge, Mars, Jesse James, Stamp, Chip, Chip, 180, 180. 180. It's the game. You've won. Um, so, yeah, I think this archetype has a lot of different avenues. I think it'll be pretty awesome. Um, it also has the Crimson Flare Pillar GX attack, which is basically Nitro Tank. Uh, you're allowed to attach five basic energy cards from your discard to your Pokemon in any way that you like. Uh, if you have at least one extra energy attached, uh, your opponent's active is now burned and confused. Uh, it's a little extra bit of help as well. Um, sometimes that could be a get out of jail option. If you're dead next turn, you can just go for like stamp, burn, confuse. Now I have a 50-50 of not losing and maybe that's enough to get me back into the game. So I think that's also pretty cool. Um, I ultimately think this will be at least a one-off addition into regular Greenzard currently. But I also think there may be like a quad, um, like a new Greenzard <laughs> built around Brilliant Flare as well. So I think this guy is going to be really awesome to experiment with. Uh, we've seen how good Magical Ribbon has been in the past, and doing Magical Rib Ribbon plus at least two hit carry pressure, whilst also being able to like gust and kill the Dene's the entire time, sounds really, really disgustingly good. I think this deck is going to be awesome and a lot of fun to play around with. We have an Embor, Stage 2. Uh, he has the Steam Dance ability, very similar to Powerful Squall. Uh, when you play this Pokemon from your hand to Evolve, uh, you may look at the top 8 cards of your deck and attach any basic energy you find there to Pokemon in any way that you like. Obviously, this is only one turn activation. Powerful Squall is all the time. Uh, Embor is for any type of energy, so he's flexible, but he's also pretty rubbish. Um, this isn't really worth setting up a Stage 2 for. You have Pokemaniac because he's a 4 retreater to maybe give yourself some consistency in finding Embor for acceleration. Uh, but who really cares? That's probably uh, very, very bad, I would say. Flareon. Um, you may notice that in the top right, we don't have a community rating for this one. That's because uh, the Tag All-Stars set came out with like 10 cards or so that are new. And I'd already done my community review at that point. So uh, there's not always going to be something. Just bear that in mind. If there's no rating on the far right from the community, that's the reason. But... But we have a bunch of these Stage 1 uh, non-GX evolutions that are trying to combine with their previous counterparts. Powerful Cheer um, says that each of your Pokemon GX that evolve from Eevee do 30 more damage to your opponent's active Pokemon. So it's like a hidden choice band in a Stage 1 form, which is pretty reasonable to be honest. Uh, we have some decent uh, evolutions out there right now. Um, Jolteon's been the one that saw the most success back when we have energy evolution in Zapdos. Um, pushing that damage is going to be really helpful. Obviously, Headbolt um, doing like 140 and then like Electro Powers to knock out the Denes. Again, always something that's on my mind now uh, because of how good Great Catcher is and how important he will be for the format. Um, that's obviously a cool option for us. It also means that Electro Bullet is really, really awesome um, for early pressure against people. Like, say you've gone first and been able to get a couple Eevees down, then um, you go turn two before your opponent evolves if they're like a Malamar deck or something you can evolve into Flareon and Jolteon and then Electro Bullet knocking out their initial ink and then like put 30 on another one that you can uh, deal with later as well so that sounds really awesome uh, I think Jolteon definitely benefits from this pretty nicely because it's so early and aggressive similarly uh, Flareon doing heat stage uh, we've basically seen Flareon only a couple times uh, we saw it in like some initial Charizard decks and we saw it in uh, um, some Mewtwo decks as well 
and having that extra 30 hidden buff can also be pretty nice for all of his attacks. It makes Heat Stage a lot more of a decent option on turn 1, especially, again, um, just because 60 is like a lot more pressure than 30 a lot of the time. Uh, it sets up numbers for Bright Flame as well, for Powerful Cheer as well. So if you're up against a tag team, and again, it's turn two, you've got both Flareons out, you do 60 into uh, 220, and that's enough to deal with tag teams. So that's a pretty nice buff for you. Also something to note is Glaceon. I mentioned it earlier with Red and Blue. Uh, Freezing Gaze is a great ability right now. Uh, make no mistake, especially with things like Stamp in format. Um, that could be a really nice disruptive archetype, and giving it that extra damage buff that it requires is really cool. I've only given Flareon a 2-star um, because I'm not so certain of how these archetypes will function because uh, they are, at the end of the day, stage 1s and they are a little bit clunky and the Flareon itself isn't that easy to search out because it's a non-GX. But at the same time, I think there's enough versatility here that an evolutions-based build might work out, especially when we look at some of the other evolutions that we have from this set. Volcarona GX, one of my favourites for sure. It's the return of Decidueye and I am ecstatic. It's a 210 hit point fire type stage one that has the ability Scorching Bomb. Once during your turn, you may discard a fire from hand if you do put two counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon. So it's not quite Feather Arrow. You do have to pay cards for it. So it's not necessarily as guaranteed as Decidueye. But as we all know, having this flexibility of damage is so insane that it can really help out. Obviously insane against non jexes for just finishing off um, easy prizes here and there to keep you up in a prize race, um, but also great for like helping you reach numbers in certain matchups. It's Fire Energy, and we know that Fire Energy is very easy to search out and recycle thanks to Flint, Hearth, and Fire Crystal getting them all back, which is obviously going to be a big f uh, focal point of this archetype. We've seen Ninetales be a nice support stage one to things like Reshizard in the past. Now we might have Volcarona uh, in the back, uh, giving us a bit of extra damage here and there. Flare Strike does 230. Having a couple Scorching Bombs on your side means you can be knocking out tag teams turn by turn, which is obviously a huge threat, and is definitely going to push a different type of build of Reshizard, I would imagine. Um, especially because, again, Volcron is good against non-GX decks, so you have that covered in the same boat, which is just really awesome to have. This flexibility of damage is always just so good. So I do believe he could be used as a support role uh, in the back, but I also think he may also be a front man. Thanks to the help of both Welder and Red and Blue, we can get using his attack Backfire very, very quickly. For two Fire and a Colors, you do 160 and return two Fire Energy from this Pokemon to your hand. That's amazing synergy. Yes, it's a little bit frustrating because you have to find your next Welder or whatever else. But at the same time, getting those energies back to hand means that you can just pop off a of uh, Scorching Bomb all over again. 160, again, decent output. We know that's the Dene range. And if you're using Scorching Bombs to set other things up, um, that's also just going to be really nice for getting over the line. So I really do think Volcarona could even come in uh, and attack when he needs to. We also have the great Heat Wave GX attack for a fire. You discard an energy from each of your opponent's Pokemon. I think this is one of those niche ones. Not ever going to be all that powerful, but in certain situations, uh, definitely whenever I played Decidueye, the more turns you had with Decidueye, the better, because you have more options to use the ability for damage. So in random spots, great Heat Wave GX might buy you an extra turn to get you more Scorching Bombs that can just get you, again, pushed over the line. So I think the GX attack is, again, something that could be pretty reasonable. Overall, like I said, Volcarona could work alongside Reshizard, could make his own deck, and I think um, one of the things I saw from Japan was that it's being uh, combined with Sylv Ally, and I think that's definitely an archetype that I want to try out, giving it the, the four-star rating. We move on to the water stuff. Black Hiram's an interesting um, basic non-GX that Quagnag might be calling out for, because at the end of the day, at the moment, they're really struggling for attackers. They're basically just using Keldeos and then the Quagsires themselves. So being able to protect your Quagsire in the bench could be a pretty big deal. And Black Hiram does come with two attacks. The first of them, Blizzard Wings for two colors, does 30 and discard a special energy from the opponent's active. Not all that useful. It's the second one that uh, had my head turning. Uh, Blizzard Dust does 100. And if you have a stadium card in play, 100 more damage. 200 for four is not too shabby. Um, compare it to something like Hydro Pump, you'd only be doing 140. And again, just that value of protecting a Quagsire on board is a really big deal for a setup deck like this. So Black Hiram may be sneaking into Quagnag. I only gave it a two star because I don't think it's guaranteed because Blizzard Dust isn't like that insane because you still end up having to get rid of your own stadiums, which is actually a little bit annoying. Um, but I still think this could be a reasonable enough card uh, to be considered in Quagnag and will be experimented with. 
Blastoise and Piplup GX was a little bit hyped from the community. I'm not really certain why, um, but it's a 270 hit point water type uh, tag team. It has the Splash Maker attack for two water and a colors. So you do 150, and you're able to attach up to three water energy from your hand to your Pokemon in any way that you like. If you do, heal 50 from each of those Pokemon uh, for each card you attached in uh, to them in this way. So the healing element's nice. Attaching energy from hand is pretty bad. Um, and ultimately, this guy's very slow. Uh, two water and a colorless. We can't really manipulate that very easily outside of using like stage 2 acceleration from regular Blastoise. Uh, 150 is not necessarily a great number either. So, yeah, I mean, he's blue, and obviously there are some good fire decks out there, but there's more to the format than just fire, and I don't see this beating much else. Uh, we also have the bubble launcher GX attack. It does 100 if your opponent's active. Oh, sorry, your opponent's active is now paralyzed. And then if this Pokemon has at least three extra energy, so six total, um, you do 150 more. 250, again, it's not a good enough number. 250 really doesn't impress me. Yes, there are some water decks that might use something like uh, Volcanium Prism to do that initial 20 um, for a lot of these tag teams. But yeah, it, it's really not that impressive. I would really be interested to see why the community are hyped on this card. Yes, in Expanded it has Aqua Patch. It's a completely different story for Expanded. It's probably going to be a great card in that meta, uh, especially if Fire Decks continue to be great in Expanded. Um, and also, this is something you could Archie Stoice with, which is pretty reasonable. Um, but at the end of the day, like I don't see how this gets set up in Standard. Um, Full Blitz is only really good because you cheat Full Blitz all the time and do it on turn 2. Splash Maker on turn 3 is very slow. Uh, yes, you can make up some ground by healing a bunch, and that would be annoying against non-GX decks trying to two-shot things. Maybe this would naturally have a good Malamar matchup, for example, just because of Splash Maker doing all that heal. Um, but I don't really know how this is going to function. Like, do you ever want to use Ultimate Ray to power up Blastoise and Piplup? No, not really. Uh, do you want to power up a Keldeo? Well, why wouldn't you just, like, attach to the Keldeo in the first place? Uh, because Splash Maker is so slow. So... Yeah, I'm going to give him a one star. Uh, let me know why you guys are rating it high in the comments, because I'm pretty baffled by this card. I, I really don't see why it's all that good. Um, but yeah, maybe some people are blinded by how it's done in like stuff like Japanese meta, but they have Aqua Patch, so it's a completely different tale and won't really translate over to our format, in my opinion. We have an interesting Fion. It has the Whirlpool Drag ability. Once during your turn, uh, if this Pokemon is on your bench, you may have your opponent switch their active with one of their benched. If you do, discard all cards attached to this Pokemon and put this Pokemon to the bottom of your deck. This card really reminds me of an old Horlucha from Steam Siege. Um, the biggest upside of this Fion is that it's whenever you want to, right? It's just if this guy's chilling on the bench, you can go ahead and do it. Horlucha was whenever you put him into play. Um, so the Fion is a lot more flexible, and I think that's actually a pretty good deal for you, to be honest, because um, a lot of the time, people are going to be like in panic situations in the late game, and they'll be like shoving you one non-GX attacker and just hoping that um, you don't have Gust for game. So if you have Fion and just like force them into anything else, you can sometimes win just off of that alone. Similarly, in some spots against like Reshizard or something, they'll just put one Reshizard into the active and be like, you can't deal with this guy. It has the biggest amount of health for you to get through. What if you just Fion and then force them into anything else and you just clear out that one or two prizes left? Uh, that's kind of the upside of Fion. Um, the downside is we have Great Catcher and that's just going to be the best option anyways. Um, and also we don't have Great Search for Fion either. Like if we had Nest Ball, I'd consider this card a lot more. Uh, but right now, I don't see a reason why you would want to put a Fiona in your deck. Um, yes, you get to like go to the bottom of your deck as well to maybe get around deck out. We sort of saw this with Suicune, and it really did nothing. So um, I don't think that's relevant either. And also, the mill decks are going to play Bryson Matt anyway, so they'll mill Fiona at some point. So it really won't matter uh, in that regard as like an anti-mill tech. We then have another Stage 1 Evolution. It's going to be the non-GX Vaporeon. <coughs> it has the Vital Air ability. As long as this Pokemon is in play, the maximum hit points of each of your Pokemon GX that evolve from Eevee is increased by 60. That's a pretty big jump. It pushes these GXs into basically tag team hit points. Flareon GX, literally a 270 hit point, two prize Pokemon. That's pretty tanky, and that's going to be really awesome. I think Vaporeon definitely is one of the reasons why I want to experiment with these evolutions, because it just makes them so damn chunky. An annoying, freezing gaze Glaceon with 260 hit points, firing Frost Spears around the board, sounds really, really gross to deal with. I think the Vaporeon's probably the most promising of the bunch, 
just because it gives these decks more time. Once you finally get a Vaporeon in play, um, it just means that your initial investment of like the early Glaceon or the early Flareon, they stay in play for longer, and it forces tag teams into the active to deal with these guys. So in theory, you'll be having up trades here and there, which is pretty cool. So I really like the Vaporeon. I think Flareon and Vaporeon are definitely the best. Uh, we'll see the Jolteon later as well. But I'm hoping that the extra 30 and the extra 60 health combined makes one of these evolution decks work. At the end of the day, I still think it's a little bit clunky and the attacks sometimes aren't enough to carry the deck in general, even with this damage buff and the extra health. Um, but against like non-GX decks, the tankiness of your opponent only taking two prizes is going to be so gross to deal with. Like getting through 270 hit points and only taking two prizes, man, that really is rude. <laughs> it's really bad. So I can see these evolutions having some reasonable matchups out here. And uh, the Vaporeon is a big reason why. We then have a Wishy Washy. It's a 180 hit point basic water type with a pretty awesome artwork. It has the ability to scatter um, at the end of your opponent's turn. If this Pokemon has any damage counters on it, flip a coin. If heads, shuffle this Pokemon and all cards attached uh, to it into your deck. So it reminds me of one of these like Wally Storley type cards. It's a Regigigas that can quote unquote self heal half the time thanks to the scatter ability. So. You could oftentimes think about Scatter as a positive outcome for you um, because you're basically healing any damage if you are tanking. Um, but I would personally say that this is a negative effect um, just because we have such terrible ball search right now for non-GXs that if you uh, flip heads or whatever... Oh, sorry, if you flip tails, um, you got to put him away and you're having to somehow get back into this guy to start walling all over again. Uh, Regigigas walls like isn't really a thing anymore just because a cerola has gone and we don't have any healing options um, And one of the facts is that there are a bunch of decks out there that play like 18 fires now and can recycle those energies um, So Wally Storley really isn't working these days, so I don't really see why wishy-washy uh, has a place in any deck right now We also have a wishy-washy GX from this set. It's a GX that only has 130 hit points. It's a water type that has the two attacks. Firstly, Schooling Storm does 20, and 20 more for each Wishy Washy and Wishy Washy GX you have in play. You can see I've done the math for you. Um, if you have the Dragon Majesty uh, meet up Wishy Washies in play, as well as the two GXs, like your main attacker and one in the back, you can be a 210 hit point basic that can do 200 with a Schooling Storm. Um, but that's really not good. <laughs> uh, Especially because a lot of these board states, like, if you prize one of your meetup up wishy washies that's a really bad thing. Also, if you've had to use the Dene, or if you have any other setup Pokemon in play whatsoever, um, that's also eating into not only your health, but also your damage. So, ultimately, that's just a really bad thing for wishy washy I think he's def definitely meme-tier garbage. Um, the big catch GX allows you to look at the top 12 and put any number of basic Pokemon you find there onto your bench. Like, sure, that's a good turn one play that you can do to set up the Schooling Storm. I can see what they're going for here, but it's still pretty grim, I would say. There's the Jolteon as we move on to the Lightning types. Speed Yell, each of your Pokemon GX in play that has uh, that evolves from Eevee, pays one colorless less to use its attacks. Now, we go back to these three examples. I think these are still the three best GXs uh, that evolve from Eevee right now. Um, Jolteon already has Tapu Koko and already has uh, Thunder Mountain, so this doesn't help them out at all. Glaceon still would be two attachments, and I would argue that they'll prefer to use a red and blue engine anyway. Um, so I don't think the Jolteon's that good in Glaceon. Maybe this is the most promising one. Um, and Flareon already has Welder. So I think two of the three won't benefit from Jolteon at all. And the Glaceon, it's debatable whether or not it needs the Jolteon. So... Um, I can definitely see the Vaporeon and Flareon making it into the list, and the Jolteon is like maybe sometimes in this already rogue evolution deck. We move on to Magneton. It's a stage one that has a crazy ability, Beacon. Once during a turn, you may choose up to three supporters from your deck, reveal them, and put them into your hand, then shuffle your deck. Oh, by the way, this Pokemon's knocked out, so <laughs> it's like a Miss Magius effect. Rather than drawing up to seven, you can go ahead and cherry pick three supporters. The reason why this is potentially powerful is because you can grab Surge and pop off with some wacky combos um, all at once, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I think my biggest headache with Magneton, obviously losing prizes is one bad thing, um, but, you know, in theory, Surge combos are going to make up for that. 
Um, the biggest reason is just it's hard to search Magneton. Uh, we have nothing easy to find the Magnemite, nothing easy to find the Magneton outside of just Pokecoms. Um, Miss Magius is hard enough to play when you already have uh, the Dust Stones and Treasures to find uh, the basics and stuff. Um, so all the work that you've done to find these Magnetons, you could probably just use trying to find the supporters anyway. Like you could just use a Missy's Favor instead and it's probably a lot easier um, to assemble like your search combo. So I really think uh, this Magneton is not very strong. Uh, fun fact, you could use it in Slow Duck just to be like burst damage and stamp proofing. Um, if you like cut down on the Laprises or something like that, or if decks go so heavily towards Great Catcher that they won't be customing things up. Um, you could just like knock out two Magnetons throughout the game without any punishment and still make the opponent go through two Slow Ducks. That could be pretty fun, but overall I don't think it's that strong. We have a great looking Raichu that has the Nuzzle Attack, and that's awesome because we still have a Molga in format, and we have Pachirisu. These things are awesome uh, for getting energies into play. Uh, obviously, the Snuggly Generator allows you to attach um, a Lightning to each of your Pokemon that has the Nuzzle attack, which is awesome because both Pikachu and Raichu have Nuzzle, which is awesome. You can search it out with a Molga, you can attach to it with Pachirisu, so we're already cooking up a nice engine for this non-GX deck. It also has the powerful Spark attack that does 20 times the amount of energy attached to all of your Pokemon. Uh, lightning energy, I should say. So that's also pretty awesome. Uh, we have great energy spread from Pachirisu. Um, we already have Electro Power to help push our damage. We have Tapu Koko Prism Star that can also get an extra two energies into play for Lightning types. And um, these non GX decks in general are getting a huge push from Rosa because they can get you an extra Raichu, they can get you more energy to attach, it can get you into more Electro Powers, it can get you into uh, great catchers. I think this archetype is going to be a very promising non GX build. The biggest fear factor I have is that it's the good old Malamar effect. Every non-GX deck right now has to somehow come up, a come up with a way to beat Malamar. And I don't know that Raichu has one. Outside of out-consistencying them, thanks to Amolga, um, I don't see a way that this archetype can be able to beat um, the Malamar decks. You'll basically be trading one-shots, except that Malamar has spell tags that can knock out your Pachirisus and Amolgas and all that stuff. Yeah, you could go ahead and probably play um, Labs, but you'd probably rather play things like Shrine or um, Power Plant or something like that to be disruptive against Tag Team and other GX decks. Um, so I'm only going to put it at 3-star. I think it's still being gatekept by Mali, um, but it seems very promising, and I think it's definitely going to be fun to play around with a Raichu for once. We move on to the Psychic types, and there's a lot of interesting stuff for Psychic. We start off with the Blacephalon, which the community are very hyped on. I too think this could definitely be a contender inside Spread Mali. It has a Psychic Colorless attack cost that puts four counters on your opponent's Pokemon in any way that you like. If your opponent has exactly three prize cards remaining, put 12 damage counters on them instead. So that's a big amount of damage. Think about uh, SBDO and how great he is as a finisher. Well, that's for three energies, and that's on a tag team, um, and it's only 10 damage. Whereas here we're doing it on a non-GX that can do 120 instead. That's a pretty big deal. Um, the reason why I haven't rated this card higher is I only think he's a maybe in Malamar. I think don't get too used to the format that we've been in. Great Catcher will be changing the game drastically. I think it may just be that Spell Tag Mali ends up playing Great Catchers instead of this card. Because 12 counters is fine, but you can just Great Catcher and use Shadow Impact instead now. Uh, on like the main targets. Yes, it's a lot more flexible because it's placing them however you like But ultimately you have a lot of control with distortion door and spell tag I don't think it's that big of a deal in my book So I think the Cephalon is very glamorous very awesome But there's a couple issues that I have against it first of all great catchers going into Malamar second of all um, It's only good for one turn. It's only if your opponent has exactly three prize cards Yes, you're in on GX deck, so oftentimes that'll be live during the game, but you have to find it that turn. And as we all know, Malamar doesn't draw how you want it to draw all the time. Uh, and uh, my third problem is it's an extra, like, deck space. Um, in theory, uh, cutting away from customs um, to add in great uh, great catchers can buy you some slots in the archetype, but um, I think Blacephalon is only a maybe for Malamar. Uh, so I'm only racing it three stars. I don't think it's guaranteed. Where I do think he's even stronger, however, is uh, in the Naga Chess deck. I think he's awesome in Naga Chess because you're oftentimes trying to set up either like Venom Shot for game or like, um, like a Grimsley for game 
or a distortion door for game alongside like a two prize knockout once you've used a stinger. Um, so I think Bacephalon could be awesome in that deck, and I definitely want to try him out in um, an Ultra Beast style deck. Um, but I don't think that Naga Chess is like above like a rogue archetype right now, just because of how difficult it is to play. Um, so I wasn't comfortable putting this any higher, to be honest. We have a nice stage 2 Gallade, which comes with a great ability double type. As long as this Pokemon is in play, it's both a Psychic and Fighting type, uh, which is awesome. Uh, it's a 160 hit point stage 2 as well. Stage 2 that actually has the support from Mysterious Treasure, which is great. It also has Rosa coming out in the set, which is awesome. And it has the Power Cyclone attack. For two colors, you do 120 and move energy from this Pokemon to one of your benched. I have a couple issues with this Glade. 120 isn't 130, so again, you're gatekept by Malamar. You're also weak to Giratina, um, so you'll just immediately lose to Mali. So you have to play this deck knowing that you immediately lose one matchup without playing a lot of other tech cards. Um, the things I like about this card, though, is that uh, he has two great typings right now. You can knock out Mew Mewtwo with the help of Diancy because you're a fighting type as well. So your Power Cyclone gets pushed to 140. And suddenly you can um, deal with Mewtwo's, which is great. And also you can obviously deal with Picarom, and you can dust uh, gust the Dene for knockouts in all sorts of matchups. So um, <coughs> this vanilla 120 being pushed by Diancy is super relevant and really awesome. So if stage twos can work, thanks to the new Rosa engine, thanks to uh, possibly the Professor Oak setting, Gallade might be good enough as long as the format remains very focused towards Pika, Mewtwo, and Reshizard. Because uh, I think Reshizard also has to play a bunch of Dedenes. You can try and uptrade in those sorts of situations. And as well, you know, Power Cyclone's knocking out uh, tag teams in two hits, even without weakness. So, yeah, Gallade seems reasonable. Uh, he's a lot of work. And, again, kind of worried by Malamar just in general. Every non-GX deck loses to Malamar, basically. Um, as long as Mali draws reasonably. So, that's the only downside, I would say, for Glade. We have a cool Mimikyu that has the ability Shadow Box. As long as this Pokemon is in play, each Pokemon's Pokemon GX with damage counters on them have no abilities. Very, very awesome disruption in the form of a basic as well, which is pretty cool. So, you can pretty much just drop him into play, and suddenly you're going to be ability locking things. Usually, this will be alongside Shrine. You could also try and do it with some other, like, Distortion Door or uh, Spell Tag or just Spread Math in general. And you're going to try and shut off some board sitters that are fully focused on their ability. Could be really annoying for the Rise of Dark box. There's a new Sylvalli that wants to draw cards. There's obviously the Volcarona we, that we've seen likes to spread damage. Uh, Naga also is denied drawing. Keldeo is to get through now. Um, you shut off their Pure Heart ability. And you even shut off Mew Mewtwo from using any attack but its own GX. So Mimikyu is a really annoying card. And could be really awesome. My question then becomes, like, what deck does he go in? Probably only Shrine variants or Spread variants. I don't think it needs to go into Malamar. Because uh, Mali's not scared of Mewtwo. It's not scared of Keldeo. Um, it's not really scared of any of these cards. Because it's going to try and uptrade on them. Maybe it's scared of Dark Box exactly. Um, so if it's not going in Malamar. Then it's going into something like a Raichu deck. Or like a Gallade deck. Or one of these other like obscure non-GX decks. Is where Mimikyu is going to have to like work his trade so i don't think it ends up going into any other archetype right now so although this ability is powerful simply because it doesn't stop to dene i don't think it's gonna be that good uh i don't think many uh tag team decks can afford to put this down uh because all the tag team decks like smack the active for the most part so yeah i don't see mimikyu going into a bunch of decks uh possibly you could put this in like a mewtwo mirror match and then you like just use sbdo to put damage on their two mewtwos and then they can't do anything um, but I think that's also a little bit cute, in my opinion. Could be pretty cool, though, so I don't know. We'll see where this Mimikyu lies in the end. Marshadow is another one of these options that could go into Malamar. It, for a Psychic do Colorless, allows you to choose one of your opponent's Pokemon's attacks, except GX, and use it as its own attack. Um, it's pretty reasonable. I think it's comparable to Copycat in a lot of situations. Obviously, it's a bit more proactive. Uh, again, it's that same issue I had with Blacephalon. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, deck space. Uh, you've got to make a space for this card. Is it going to be better than Mimikyu? Probably not, because Mimikyu can filch in bad situations and can be a two-energy attacker also in bad situations, which this card can't achieve. Um, and how many matchups is this actually good against? Shadow Mimic isn't very good uh, against a lot of the tag teams. Uh, sure, you can full Blitz for 150, but that's basically the same as Shadow Impact anyway. 
Um, you can maybe do Tandem Shocking, but that's probably not going to be all that great. Um, it's very, very good against Fire decks. I think that's where he's the best. Doing Brilliant Flare to be able to search cards from your deck is awesome. And also copying Flare Strike with Spell Tag Damage is awesome. Just basically more Mimikyu's in your deck. Um, but outside of that, it, obviously it can't be used against Mewtwo. It won't be able to be used against the new Reshiram. Um, it won't be able to be used against Blacephalon. There's a bunch of decks where this card is just dead. So I think, again, he's only a maybe in Malamar and probably not good enough to make the cut, in my opinion. We have an Oricorio GX, which I am awesome. Like, I'm so happy to see this card back. I think this card is really, really awesome. It's a Psychic type, um, basic 170 hit point um, GX that has the ability Dedicated Dance. Once during a turn, if one of your Pokemon was knocked out during your opponent's last turn, you may draw three cards. You can't use more than one of this ability per turn, but this ability is absolutely nuts. <clears throat> for anyone who's followed the channel for a long time, Instructor Ranguru is a card that I've tried to shoehorn in basically every deck that I could just to defend against things like N. Now, finally, we have this Oricorio that can defend against Reset Stamp, which I'm really, really over the moon about. Uh, Dedicated Dance is just this awesome card late game. How often have you seen recent games be decided by your opponent just going, Stamp, knock out, hope that your opponent can't respond or have enough of a hand to respond on me, and then I'll just close the game and win the next turn. Well, Oricorio gives you that extra defense so that even if you're stamped to like one card, you still have a five card hand to play with. If you draw for turn and then dedicated dance, you can go ahead and have plenty of access towards like Dedenne to push you for game or all these other supporter cards to draw you cards. Hopefully something like Great Catcher or like that last energy or whatever you need to attack with. It's just going to really be a fantastic closer for you. I think this Oricorio is especially good because it has such great searchability options. We have both Cherishable and Treasure for this guy. So it could end up being even in non-GX decks as well. Um, just sitting there, chilling, and when stuff gets knocked out, you're getting that extra benefit. So you can pop him down early. He's not just an Instructor Ranguru. Um, he can just be used throughout the game and drawing you three cards guaranteed is always very, very strong. I really do think this card is great. It's essentially like a Persian GX. Obviously, its ability is a lot weaker. Um, but it's only one deck space, and you can get it down when you need to, whereas that's not always the case with Persian. So I think he's excellent, very, very searchable, and defense against reset stamp is really important these days. Yes, it's a GX ability, so it can get shot off by power plant plus stamp, but there's already Chaotic Swell that we've discussed, and there's already things like Marshado that you can have, especially if you're a treasure deck, you can just have that resetting hole chilling on your bench um, for like a Mewtwo player or whatever, and then you can just benefit from this Oricorio. So... Yeah, I think this card is nuts. Gave him the four star because he's like a consideration in basically everything that's not a greens deck um, because he's just so flexible and powerful and will save you in the late game, which is always pretty important. We come to this Solgaleo and Lunala. We mentioned this tag team when we mentioned uh, Lily's um, full force, and now we'll go over it in a bit more detail. Uh, essentially, it has two powerful attacks. Cosmic Burn does 230 for three Psychic and a Colorless. Essentially, it's Flare Strike, but in Psychic form. Uh, this can't use Cosmic Burn during your next turn. I think that's actually better than Flare Strike, even though the card is exactly the same as Flare Strike. And the reason is it's for Psychic Energies, uh, because of course we have Malamar, but also because you're probably going to be playing a Malamar deck that's going to have a bunch of Spell Tags in there, and you can put some prior damage on things. If you're doing Distortion Doors and Spell Tag damage, you're probably setting up these tag teams early enough for Cosmic Burn to finish them off, which is actually really important. Whereas most of the time, Charizard won't be taking knockouts with 230 anymore. Uh, Cosmic Burn probably will be, thanks to some prior damage that you put on, thanks to your, uh, well, basically the deck this card is played in. And then we have this Light of the Protector GX attack. You do 200 for two Psychic and a Colorless. And if you play Lily's Full Force from your hand during this turn, prevent all effects of attacks, including damage done to each of your Pokemon during your next turn. I think this is phenomenal. I think this effect is really, really good. I wish that Lily's Full Force was a stronger card, um, but this combo is obviously just super good. You buy yourself a turn, 200 again. It's not like a barnstorming amount of damage, but just imagine the case where you're like a couple prizes behind. You just do a great catcher. You uh, light the protector, take a knockout on a Dedenne, and then you're set up for Cosmic Perm for game for the next turn. Like, your opponent just can't do anything. It's like using an Iron Rule GX, but with an extra 200 damage. That's just such a dangerous prospect that Malamar has been dying for some comeback potential. It reminds me of Moon's Eclipse, um, but it's way more guaranteed because it's all your Pokemon in play. So it really gives Malamar the bounce back potential that it might need. I think Malamar might be 
once again separating its builds. Um, we saw Spell Tag Mali come out on top um, over the um, Tina Chomp and over Ultra uh, like from Worlds onwards, but there's a potential new contender in Malamar, and that's this build that's playing like three copies of Lily's Full Force alongside more usual supporters, and then you play this guy, even if it's just one count of this in the deck, so that against tag team decks, you can just try and combo Light of the Protector into Cosmic Burn and make big comebacks. And the best thing about Malamar is it plays off the board as well, so it's going to be stamp-proof for the most part. So, yeah, really, really insane. I think this card is pretty good. Uh, I've only given it the two-star rating because it's making Malamar less consistent and giving it extra tag teams that they can, like, start and all that stuff, and it's weak to Psychic. So there's a lot of liabilities here, and Lily's Full Force isn't a good card in general. So it's rare that putting worse cards in your deck gives you better results. Um, that's the reason why I'm skeptical, but you can definitely see where I'm coming from with this uh, because that GX attack is really worth building around, in my opinion. We have the coughing and wheezing that I mentioned with the Roxy combo. Here you can see its ability. Um, once again, I'll outline it. Once during your turn, if this Pokemon is discarded by the effect of Roxy, you can put one count on each of your opponent's Pokemon. Um which is pretty awesome. Uh, I think, realistically, this is probably going to try and uh, make the Detention Gas Weezing deck a bit more of a thing. The idea is you just play a bunch of the Coffings, maybe, again, like I said, one copy of the new Weezing, and you just play a bunch of Lana's Fishing Rods. They can get you back Spell Tags as well as Coffings and Weezings, and uh, that's going to be like a four of the Fishing Rod. And you just try and use Roxy to draw through your deck and get you into more damage from these Coffings and Weezings, hoping that it adds up alongside the Detention Gas uh, to make life difficult for the opponent and give you a bit of extra burst aggression. Uh, trying to reuse this Roxy will be pretty fun and interesting to see how powerful it gets because I really, like, I'm really not sure how many times you'll get the full value from Roxy throughout a game. But if you're able to essentially get, like, let's say, like, your opponent's trying to limit their bench, for example, if you're only hitting, like, three targets, but you do that, like, three times with Roxy, that's still, like, a free 60 damage whilst also drawing, like, a bunch of cards. So. Yeah, I think the card's definitely reasonable, and um, it's worth exploring for Weezing. I don't think it's all that strong, um, just because I don't think it's super consistent, but definitely worth exploring for sure. We move on to the fighting types now with Excadrill. Um, the main reason I'm mentioning this card is because he's a fighting type that can knock out Dedenes. Again, I'm fully invested into how good Great Catcher is, and how much he will be changing the game or how Great Catcher will change the game. So Excadrill might come in as one of those options. He's a fighting type 140 hit point um, stage one that has two attacks. The first is 11th hour tackle. You do 30, but if you have three or less cards in your deck, you do 150 more. I think that's pretty gimmicky and bad. But Drill Bazooka does 120 for one fighting, and you can discard four cards from the top of your deck. Again, not great, but it does enough to knock out the Dene's. It does enough to knock out Pika Roms. Um, you can also put Diancy down, and you can knock out Choo Choo's. So this could be like an answer in decks that play Rainbows or Unit Energies to the Pika Rom matchup, whilst also giving you extra options to kill the Dene's uh, with that Gust. So I could see him maybe being squirmed into some non-GX builds. Um, just for that reason alone. He also does have four retreat costs as well, which will be relevant for a card that we talk about later. We move on to another stage two GX in Flygon. We have the Sandstorm Protection ability. As long as this Pokemon is your active, any damage done to Pokemon from your opponent's attacks is reduced by 30. That's all of your Pokemon have that reduction, so it's pretty good against some spread. Um, it means that the Dene's are out of range of a Mewtwo snipe from a Naga, which is pretty cool, or just a Naga snipe in general from a Blown. Um... <clears throat> but I think overall it's not that strong. Uh, you have two attacks, both for three fighting energy. Obviously, fighting does have karate belt, and we have the new red and blue supporter, which can try and mitigate this high attack cost. Um, but you do 120 with Desert Hurricane, and if there's a stadium in play, you do 120 more and discard that stadium card. Again, it's situational. Um, you need to not only set up a stage two, you need to get a bunch of energies, you need to get a stadium in play as well to be doing reasonable damage. Uh, we do have Diancy, we do have Dojo, which gives us extra damage buff as well, which is all like somewhat reasonable, but I think it's so much work to get a stage two out in this day and age that it's really not going to be that strong. It's GX attack, Sonic Edge does 220, and it's not affected uh, by the effect of your opponent's uh, active Pokemon, so it goes for effects similar to Double Blaze. Um, but again, I don't think it's great. It's just so much work to get Flygon rolling. I'm uh, pretty depressed by this because I'm a huge Flygon fanboy, and he's been treated well in the past, but this guy is just a bit of a flop. We have another Lycanroc. Um, it has the Boiling Blood ability. Uh, if your opponent's 
Pokemon, or sorry, if your opponent has any GX in play, the energy cost for this Pokemon is reduced by three colorless. So essentially, it means that you can attack for free with this Lycan Rock. It's only 60 damage though. However, if your opponent's active has any special energy, you do one, uh, you sorry, yeah, you do 130 total, so 70 extra damage. Um, again, I only raise this because it could be a great catcher target for knocking out the Dene's for no energies with the help of Diancy. The only thing is, uh, it's a lot of combo pieces. Even though you don't need the necessary energy to use a fighting type, you need to have a Diancy, you need to get the stage one out, and you need to be using great catchers. So I think it's pretty niche and narrow. Uh, there aren't enough um, relevant special energy decks out there right now to get that extra effect of Voltage Claw. So it's basically just doing 60 for free, which really isn't all that impressive. We move on to the Dark types now with an Alolan Persian GX. It's a 200 hit point Dark type stage one. Um, but has the smug face ability. Prevent all effects of attacks, including damage done to this Pokemon by your opponent's tag teams, your opponent's Ultra Beasts, and Pokemon with any special energy attached to them. I just mentioned with the Lycanroc that special energies basically aren't anywhere these days, so that's like one thing. But saying no to Ultra Beasts and tag teams is a big portion of the meta. We've seen Mewtwo can get around this uh, with Double Blaze and with um, Greninja. We've seen the... Um, the Cephalon can get around this with using Heatran. So straight away, I think the decks that this is trying to wall against, people already naturally have the answers to. That's the reason why I'm not rating this much higher. The archetypes that I'm fully aware of right now in the format all have means of getting around this Persian naturally in their deck. They don't need to make any adaptation to get around this. Some tag teams like maybe um, Green Zard or um, Guardian might struggle a little bit more. Um, and that's where Alolan Persian might thrive. It might just be like one of these ditto evolutions that you have in certain decks um, to punish those, and it might force some sort of change from those builds, but even then they can try and use like other attackers in their deck to get around this Alolan Persian. Um, so I don't think it's a huge deal, especially because Claw Slash just does for Dark and Two Colors 120. That's not a great deal. Um, one thing that I will note though, however, is that it's finally a walling Pokemon that's good against Malamar. Keldeo really struggles against Malamar because it's trying to wall uh, GXs. Malamar's a non-GX deck, and they just uptrade on you, and you can't even knock out Giratinas outside of your GX attack. A Lowland Persian is a dark type, so it hits for weakness, it knocks out Giratinas, and it has psychic resistance. So it's finally one of these walling Pokemon that actually has a chance against Malamar, which is something worth noting. It does have acceleration in the form of red and blue, which is cool. Um, you can try and play things like Chaotic Swells to get around Power Plants, which is also pretty cool. Um, but I think there's still a lot of struggle for this card in general, just because 120 against the tag team decks isn't really good enough damage. It also has the Stalking Claw GX attack that does 120 to one of your opponent's Pokemon. Again, it's not that fantastic. Um, really not much to shout about. I think because naturally all these decks have answers, this Persian won't end up being all that good. It does harp back to Honchkrow, though, and it might make something like a Persian Honchkrow deck a thing, just in general. Um, they may like combine together thanks to red and blue and come to be some sort of like annoying walling style archetype. We have a phenomenal uh, Guzzlord, which I'm super ecstatic about. I'm really happy to start playing Dark Box again from this format. And it's because of the combination of Tag Whistle, Red Blue, and this Guzzlord. I think these three, these three things come together to completely change the way that we know Dark Box, make it much more consistent, and now have a much better payoff because we have this very chunky non GX, a 150 hit point Dark type that also has Psychic Resistance, that has uh, two attacks. The first is Mountain Munch, you discard the top card of your opponent's deck. We don't really care about that much. But we have the red Viking attack for two dark and two colorless. You do 120, and if your opponent's active is knocked out by damage from this attack, you take one more prize card. Oh, yes. Taking more prize cards is awesome. We've seen how Greedy Crush can function in the dark deck. Now we have it on one energy less on a non-GX. That sounds awesome to me. Uh, 120 damage is actually really decent um, because of Black Lance. Uh, dark Cry and Umbreon using Black Lance prior does 150, so 150 into 170, as we know, is great against tag teams. And doing the 60 snipe that Umbreon Dark Ride does to the bench can set up a Dedene for a Red Viking knockout for three prizes as well. So I think the 120 is absolutely fine numbers. Um, I think this might overtake 
uh, the need for Sabletar in the deck, or may just become like alongside him. I think the biggest upside of this is that you're taking an extra prize card even when you're not against GXs, which Sabletar only states for GX Pokemon. So it means that up against non-GXs, you have amazing catch-up potential, something that the Dark Box deck never really had. It only really relied on Super Scoop Up to get back into the game against non-GX decks. Now you just go, well, I'm going to use Red Viking and uh, all your Giratinas or all your other attackers, they just get knocked out and I take two prizes for them and I'm going to completely race ahead. So yeah, Dark Box gets a phenomenal Malamar matchup now and just in general, you're going to be great at Grinching Dedenes and you're going to be just great at even knocking out tag teams uh, for extra value whilst having a non-GX in the active and making life awkward for them. So yeah, this Guzzlord is absolutely nuts. Uh, he's also an Ultra Beast, so... Uh, like I said earlier, you can remove the Naganadel from your deck altogether, and you'll still have the option to Beast Ring to this guy, which is awesome. And you can even have that Beast Dite um, tool card that I mentioned earlier to, again, manipulate that red Viking damage to be even better if you really want to. Overall, I think the Umbreon Darkrai is probably going to be sufficient uh, for setting up numbers for this guy. Um, but you, stay, you still might want this guy just to, like help close games that much more and make his math just a little bit stronger but overall i think this is one of the key reasons why dark box gets stronger i think the engine's better thanks to red and blue but i think the guzzlord is a huge payoff card steelix is the card i was mentioning earlier when i talked about that um excadrill um <coughs> having the four retreat cost and why that's relevant well it's because of this thwomp fall attack that we have from steelix the 170 hit point stage one metal type it does 50 and you can discard any number of pokemon from your hand that have a retreat cost of four and you do 50 for each you discard in this way very gimmicky it's essentially like a weavile eggs deck where vilify was throwing pokemon into the bin now it's a lot more specific because it has to be four retreat cost pokemon um, obviously we have Pokemaniac, which can supplement this. Uh, Pokemaniac essentially reads deal 200 damage to the opponent's active uh, if you're playing in a Steelix deck, which is pretty fun. Um, but I think overall this will be a gimmicky archetype. The only thing I will mention is that you only really need to Thwomp Thaw like a couple of times. This reminds me of like Baby Blounds in many cases where you just accumulate a bunch of fire energies and just show your opponent a bunch of those all at once and then they're like, oh, I guess I died. And this is on a very, very chunky non-GX once again. Um, you've got even more chunky options with this hit, with this card because you have like metal goggles or a frying pan that you can attach to him and really be a pain to deal with. Um, you've got triple acceleration which can work off this guy and you've got welder as well if you really want to. Um, I think the coolest thing about this sort of archetype is that you'll get to play things like Excadrill and maybe play even a couple of uh, Fighting Energies so that you can do like one big thump fall for a massive knockout and then just let the Excadrills deal with the Denes for game. Um, so I think this could be a pretty fun uptrade card. I think there's something here. Uh, the majority of um, people are saying this card is going to be terrible. I don't disagree with them just because um, obviously you get like reset stamped and then your damage goes um, to pot or whatever. Um, but definitely going to be a fun archetype, very similar to Baby Blounds um, in how I believe it will function. Uh, it's just, it's not as easy to like crystal back all your Pokemon. You need to like slowly accumulate your Pokemon all over again for big thwomps. That's the biggest problem I foresee. We move on to the fairy types now with an Alolan Ninetales, another promising non-GX card. Uh, it has the Dust Blow attack, which for free does 10 times the amount of Pokemon tools in your discard pile. Um, so it really reminds me of Rotomotor Rotom, the archetype that I've loved to toy around with in the past. Always a fun rogue of mine, and Alone in Nine Tails feels like it's going to function the same way. Try and have a bunch of discard synergy cards, like Hapus and Dedenes, uh, even things like Adventure Bag, to get a bunch of tools into your discard pile. The difference between this card and Rotom, however, is that you also get the benefit of all these fairy charms. So you can be a super annoying wall deck for a large portion of the format. You've got Lightning Charms, you've got Ability Charms, Ultra Beast Charms. Go ahead and even throw in Psychic and uh, Dragon Charms just to increase your overall tool count and find the right one for the right occasion. Put it on the active and keep putting it on the active over and over again um, to make life really awkward for whatever deck you're up against. So these Fairy Charms, super annoying, and this Alolan Ninetales deck is going to try and breeze its way to two hit KOs in the format whilst slowly trying to whittle away your opponent out of resources uh, that have that essentially means that they're left with no answers to this fairy charm combo um, ultimately i think it's gonna remain a rogue again one of these cards that's just kept in check by malamar and all these other things and won't be all that consistent in general i wouldn't imagine um, but 
at the end of the day, it seems pretty fun, and these charms are going to be annoying to wall against people as well. Cottony and Whimsicott come with a Lost March attack. We gain more Lost Marches in the format. Um, I'm going to give this a one star, because essentially, Cottony is Natu, and Lost March is doing nothing with four Natus in the deck right now. Um, basically, as soon as DC went out of the format, Lost March was terrible. Um, and that's still the case. Uh, the Cottony and Whimsicott both work off of DCE, so it really doesn't matter that we have more Pokemon with Lost March. Uh, it has basically no impact, is my opinion. Um, maybe if we have DCE reprinted or some other means of, like, getting extra attachments for non-GXs or something, um, this would be a relevant upgrade, and, like, you could just go more towards these um, DCE style attackers, but we don't, so Cotney and Whimsicott really has no impact on the game at all. Florgus and Floette are some pretty pesky evolutions that both have the flower picking ability. Uh, the Floette, first of all, uh, when you evolve, you can um, choose a card at random from your opponent's hand and they have to shuffle it back into their deck. And then the Florgus does the same effect, but twice. Uh, you choose two cards at random from the opponent's hand, and they shuffle them back into the deck. This reminds me of an old Serena. Um, the Serena actually got to choose a card from your opponent's hand, whereas these ones, it seems that they're random. It does say choose cards in your opponent's hand, but it says your opponent reveals those cards, so I'm pretty sure it's choose at random. Um, and if that's the case, I don't think it's that strong. I think hand locking right now should just be left to the bird control deck. I think Lieutenant Surge, Jesse James, Mars is far stronger in general. Um, having this sort of random elements, also when they're shuffling rather than discarding, it's just prolonging things and making them have bad hands. But um, I don't think it's as solid as just going for pure hand lock. So if you're going for this approach, stick with the birds, I say. We move on to Togepi, Cleffer, and Iglybuff GX, some of the most unlikely tag teams in my opinion, but really awesome to see. Um, it's a 240 hit point fairy type tag team uh, that has two attacks. The first is Rolling Panic. You do 120, flip a coin until you get tails, 30 more for each heads. Obviously gimmicky and terrible. And speaking of gimmicky and terrible, we have Supreme Puff GX. For two fairy, you get to take another turn. Very cool. Uh, but if you have 14 extra fairy attached to this guy, your opponent shuffles all of their benched Pokemon and all cards attached to them into their deck. Now, as soon as the ladder drops, I'm definitely going to be trying some sort of expanded shenanigans with this. I'm uh, going to play a bunch of, bunch of Elixirs, a bunch of Xerneas, and get as many energies into play as possible onto some sort of barrier Pokemon, and then I'll just aromatize them all over to Togepi, Clefer, and Iglybuff. Um, but in standard, we have no way of getting this amount of energies in play. 16 energy is an unreal amount. It means that your deck will be inconsistent as hell. And basically, you'll never be able to get that, am uh, that amount of energies into play uh, to actually get the full effect. So, yeah, very, very bad. Uh, I've tried to at least humor you with, like, Surge Mina combos or B-String Tag Switch combos. But, no, in standard, this will never work. Um, in expanded, however... You might get some highlight reel moments. <laughs> I really think it's still going to be gimmicky and terrible, but uh, your opponent shuffling their entire bench in and then you take a turn just means that you like retreat out of this card and attack with something else to win the game. If you've got 16 energies in play, you can just use like anything to close the game. You can use like a Tapu Lele to close the game or something. Um, so yeah, that could be a pretty fun thing. Um, but overall, yeah, very fun, uh, but not strong at all in standard. We come to Arceus, Dialga, and Palkia GX. This is also a highly rated card by the community. Um, I've kind of been back and forth with this card. There was a point where I had it at one star, and then I was like, uh, he's just too versatile to be a one. I don't really see the huge hype around this card personally, because I don't see any archetype that's going to be all that strong thanks to him. I accept that his attacks are pretty good. I just don't like his attack costs for the most part. Let's start off with his GX attack, Altered Creation. For a metal, allows you for the rest of the game, your Pokemon's attacks do 30 more damage to your opponent's active. So it's like a hidden choice band um, in many ways, or like having a hidden Incineroar in play. And um, if this also has a water attached, um, your Pokemon, oh sorry, when your opponent's active Pokemon is knocked out by damage from those attacks, take an extra prize card. So that's pretty awesome. You've just seen how much I love the Guzzlord, and I uh, sort of mentioned it. In the same vein as Mega Sableye Titar, that greedy crush attack that allows you to take extra prizes. And I admit that that's a great way to have huge comeback mechanics. But I think the tempo of Arceus Dialga Palkia is so slow. Um, 
Like, you can only use Alter Creation turn one if you use, like, an Ends Resolve and then got this guy into the active, whilst also hitting off the Ends Resolve, like, a Water and a Lightning. Oh, sorry, a Water and a Metal. And, yeah, that, that, that's so slow. And you do no tempo. You waste your Jets attack not taking a knockout that turn or even pressurizing the opponent. Um, yes, it means that you can potentially win just, like, two turns later by... Um, bringing up, like, Dedene and knocking out of Ultimate Ray and then powering something up to then knock out a tag team to win. Um, so I guess that you, like, recover that tempo from Alter Creation being so slow later down the line, but that's only if stuff's gone well for you, and that's only if you did the turn one ends resolve to get Alter Creation off in the first place whilst you got into the active. And that's a lot of ifs and buts, especially when ends resolve isn't drawing you any cards. So, yeah, I think this is actually a pretty slow card, personally. Ultimate Ray for a Water Metal Colorless is 150. Then you get to search your deck for up to three basic energy and attach them to your Pokemon in any way that you like. Then shuffle your deck. So this is very similar to Full Blitz, but even more flexible because uh, it can go anywhere, not just to one target on your bench, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I do admit that this is great acceleration. Uh, but again, it's just you're playing a deck that has two different types of energy. And what do you want to attach to when you're already uh, pigeonholed into Water and Metal? There actually aren't that many good attackers that you can power up. Like, you never want to power up more Arceus Dialga Palkias, because 150 is not good enough. Um, even if they're doing 180, thanks to Alter Creation GX, it's not really good enough. Um, maybe onto, like, Keldeo or something like that to, like, do Sonic Edging. But, yeah, I'm really not seeing this. I know in the Japanese format it's been, like, incredible, but it's pretty different in their format. So, uh, I mean, I don't think it's comparable to standard currently um, at all because they have choice band. So Keldeo can do 170 instead of 140, which is what it would be doing in our format. So the Keldeo can be knocking out the Dene's when you power it up. And that's a big deal because knocking out the Dene for three prizes is really good um, when it's on a Keldeo where all you need to do is like buy time for a turn to win the game. So, yeah, I, I think it's pretty different. Um, maybe I'm just underselling this sort of hidden effect of the extra prize. Um, maybe I'm too tempo-focused as a player. Um, but, yeah, I just don't see it. I think there's going to be experimentation, but I think ultimately it's going to fall flat to the other mainstream archetypes that we have. I don't think it's necessarily going to be consistent, and I think it feels pretty high rolly in my book. If you want to take extra prizes, the dark deck seems like the best option to go for, because uh, that seems much more flexible and will work a lot more. That's my own personal opinion, to be honest. We move on to a Comet O. He's a stage two. Um, he's a 160 hit point dragon type. It has Shout of Power. You do 60 and can attach a basic energy from your discard to one of your benched. And you have the scale uppercut attack for lightning fighting. Um, you do 90 and you may discard a tool from this Pokemon. If you do, it does 90 more damage. I think ultimately it has a good amount of support. It has like Dojo, Karate Belt, Lance Package, has Coco Prism Star. It does have a lot going for it, but um, and even it has the uh, Hakamoo, which can evolve if your opponent has GXs in play, so you can be a bit of a cheater and get the stage 2 up a little bit quicker. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to be that great. The U-turn board's a fun combo for being able to scale up a cut turn after turn after turn for 180, though. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just too much work overall. Naga Guzzlord is, again, one of these pretty hyped tag teams. Again, I'm going to sit on the fence on this card. I think the best thing about this card is that it has 280 hit points instead of 270. So it is certainly a chunky card. And it, uh, importantly, stays out of range out of um, the Reshiram Zekrom deck. Um, it's an Ultra Beast, which is nice and searchable. And uh, it has a cool ability in Violent Appetite. Once during a turn, you may discard a Pokemon from your hand if you do heal 60 from this guy. So it's like a built-in PCL, which is pretty cool when you need it. And it really does add to the tank ability of this deck. Like, imagine some non-GXs trying to reach two hit KOs, but you've naturally got 280, and then you're going to be able to heal 60 as well. That can really force uh, non-GX decks into a bit of a pickle. My only question would be, well what deck do you want to put this in? Uh, the Weavile deck can already beat non-Jex decks without doing the whole healing shenanigans because it would really prefer to use Guzzlord anyway. Malamar doesn't want to do that because it can beat non-Jexes anyway as well. So the ability is only really good against non-Jex decks, I would argue. And that's just not that relevant anymore. <laughs> so the decks that he wants to go in, thanks to his attack costs, uh, already can beat those sorts of builds. Um, it does come with two attacks, Jet Pierce for a Psychic Dark Colorless does 180, 
Again, the attack cost is awkward. You've got to play multiple types of energy, which I'm not a big fan of. 180 is a good number. Um, you can obviously knock out Dedenes with Great Catcher. That's another reason why he's on the slide. Um, I always want to mention that because it's going to be such a big part of the game <laughs> in future. Um, and it also has Beast Diet, so it could potentially push even more damage with Jet Pierce, but I never like enough to knock out tag teams, so I didn't think it was relevant to put on the slide. And we also have the Chaotic Order GX attack for a colorless. You get to turn all of your face cards, fa sorry, all of your prize cards face up. And if this also has that same cost, the Psychic and Dark attached to it as well, you get to take two prize cards. Now, this is certainly a good GX attack. Um, it's essentially like using um, a town map whilst also being able to cherry pick the right two prizes at the exact same time. So it's like you're using a Hapu almost in that you're able to look at those six and then take the two best at the right time. That's pretty cool. I do think that the Dark deck already has better GX attack options. Malamar kind of does have the space open for GX attacks, um, but I don't think this uh, Naga Guz sort of makes its entrance into the deck for Chaotic Order. I don't think it's good enough um, to be worth putting a tag team into Malamar, to be honest. So, yeah, I think there's just no home for this card right now. Uh, yes, there's also B-String for getting him rolling, but I don't think um, Blounds wants to play this. I don't think uh, any other B-String deck wants to play this necessarily. So, yeah, and... Because of his own ability, he can't be like a quad greens deck that's just trying to heal all the time. Um, so, yeah, no home for Naga Girls, in my opinion. We then come to Reshiram and Zekrom GX, and look at the community results. 78.7% say this is a five-star card. That's a huge wave of people hyped around this guy, and it's for great reason. Uh, I mean, just straight away, without even reading the card, look at the support that's on this slide. You've got Naga support, you've got all the Welder fire support, you've got Treasure support, you've got Coco and the new Ends Resolve. Like, you have all the best support in the game wrapped into one because this guy is a Dragon type that has fire and lightning attack costs. So we know that fire and lightning is like the best two types right now in support. And also being a Dragon type means he's treasurable that also works off... Of Naga. It's just unreal how much support this guy has at his fingertips. He's a 270 hit points tag team that has the fabled flare bolts attack. For fire lightning, you do 90 and you can discard up to three in any combination of basic fire and lightning from your benched Pokemon. This attack does 90 for each you discarded in this way. So obviously this is incredible. Um, it's very similar to Explosive Jet from Turtonator in many ways, uh, but it's on a 90 modifier rather than a 50 modifier, which is unreal. Uh, I imagine this will be paired with charging up Nagas. Uh, that's the main way I see this going, just because it seems pretty easy. You're going to be playing a high treasure count, you'll play Cherish Balls, and you'll just have access to charging up. You'll do that a bunch and then Flare Bolts them off and then charge them back up again. So kind of similar to like Turbo Ray and stuff as well. Um, so yeah, this is absolutely nuts. You have Lightning and Fire. So Welder can be live all the time in this deck to get him rolling as quickly as turn one, um, which just sounds really, really awesome to me. Uh, you also have the Cross Break GX attack, which we already mentioned when we were talking about the Ends Resolve card. For two Fire, two Lightning, pretty pricey. Uh, but again, Welder makes things easy and Tapu Koko makes this easy. So this could even be live like from turn one. Uh, you can do 170 to one of your opponent's bench, and if you played Ends Resolve from your hand during this turn, you can do 170 to one of your opponent's other bench Pokemon. So there may be these highlight reel moments where an Ends Resolve just goes haywire, hits three targets, and then you just manually attach for turn, get into the active, and cross break two cards, and like completely steamroll the game from there. Like that is insane high roll if you're able to do that. Um, it would be rare, but it just is completely game-winning immediately. It's just so nuts. Being able to like knock out two Dedenes straight away would be crazy. Or if you're up against a non-GX deck, you just kill two of their main things straight away. Like That would be absolutely back-breaking if you're able to do this early. Um, but yeah, overall, I think this archetype will be strong. Fable Flare Bolts does amazing damage. It might be forcing um, Choice Helmets into the format, just because 270 is this guy's cap, uh, that's enough to deal with Mewtwo, Reshizard, Guardian, Picarom, Choo Choo. Every relevant tag team gets knocked out right now. Um, so this is just absolutely awesome. And yeah, I think he has so much support behind him that there's going to be a combination that makes him work. Uh, I'm pretty certain he's probably just going to be like a two of in decks and he'll almost be like a Abilities are in terms of you having some non-jexes like Turtonator, some uh, 
something like a heat run in the deck as well. I can see you being one of these decks that has like a bunch of different options to you. I don't think this will end up being a deck like the Cephalon, where you just play like four four nag, four of this guy, and hope that Fable Flare Bolts is enough to win your games because. I don't think it's like clever enough to beat some of these other decks that can throw non GXs your way and stuff. So I don't think he just sort of bursts onto the scene and starts smack, smack, smacking and winning. I think we got to try and mold a deck that has some other like tricks up its sleeve um, because it is a tag team and that's kind of the nature of tag teams. They need to somehow gain an advantage here, there um, and skew prize trades in certain situations. But ultimately, too much support for this card to fail. His damage output is nuts. And uh, I think the format might start being warped around him just because Flare Bolts is such a crazy powerful attack. We then come to Ultra Necrozma. Um, it's a 110 hit point Dragon Ultra Beast that has the Ultra Burst ability. Uh, this Pokemon can only attack if your opponent has two or few prize, two or fewer prize cards remaining. It then does 170 for a Psychic and a Metal, discarding an energy from your opponent's active as well. 170, decent damage, great catch is always on the slide whenever it's doing enough to deal with the Dene's. Uh, you know me at this point. Uh, but yeah, I think this is pretty poor. It doesn't go into Malamar in my opinion. We've uh, established that metal energies in Malamar aren't really worth the spaces right now. It's too inconsistent. Um, and the fact that this is such a niche attacker, it can only work late game, um, really puts me off the card. And I don't think its damage is good enough to like outweigh a space. It's only 40 more damage than a uh, Tina and you can already like make up for that with like shr uh, Shrine or um, Spell Tag like throughout the game earlier so I don't think it's a big deal at all. We come to the colorless types to round us out starting with a Beware it's essentially a Dodrio in a different form it has the ability carry run as long as this Pokemon is on your bench your active Pokemon's retreat cost is too less uh, I think we have too many good switching options most people just want to play pivoting with Jirachi anyways um, so this Beware doesn't really have a home. We then have the Eevee that sort of wraps together this whole Eevee deck that I've sort of mentioned a few times throughout this video. It has the Tail Block attack. Search your deck for any number of Eevee and Eevee GX and put them onto your bench. So essentially you just get the full board straight away. It's a little bit slow to spend your attack not dealing damage, but you are able to at least fill your board, uh, meaning that you can then just start looking for the Vaporeon, the Flareon, then your main attacker, and just start swinging and taking full advantage of that. So this Eevee really does wrap together the sort of Flareon Evolutions package uh, that we're thinking of here. So a uh, pretty nice addition for the Evolution players. We then have Megalopony and Jigglypuff, another um, sort of strange combo, but a really powerful tag team nonetheless. It's a 240 hit point colorless tag team that has the Jumping Balloon attack. It does 60 base and 60 more for each of your opponent's GX and EX in play. This really reminds me of Salamance EX, a very powerful card uh, from way back when. It used to do 10 base and 50 more for each EX your opponent had in play, and that was like crazy good. Jumping Balloon, therefore, I'm very convinced will be an excellent card. Its damage output is just too, too high, too often, I would say. Like, if your opponent has three GXs in play, Jumping Balloon's already like a super big threat, so... Yeah, I mean, this card is very, very good. It's just three colorless as well, so it's very flexible. It can go into anything that plays Welder. It can be full blitzed onto. Uh, you can wash out to this card. Uh, Mewtwo can throw it into the bin and copy it again, Welder. So, yeah, Jumping Balloon is going to be very, very strong. Uh, right now, we know that there are plenty of decks very reliant on heavy Dedene engines, uh, tag teams all over the place, and Low Puff is definitely going to punish that for sure. It also has the Puffy Smashes GX attack. Uh, your opponent's active Pokemon is now asleep. And then if this Pokemon has at least four extra energy, so five total, um, you get to do a 200 damage snipe to one of your opponent's bench Pokemon. I wouldn't sleep on this either. I mean, if you've just done a Jumping Balloon, taken a knockout, uh, you've already got three energies on you. And like then you're just like a Welder away or a Tag Switch away or whatever else um, to go straight into the 200 snipe. And we've seen how good uh, Naga has been for closing games in Mewtwo just for basically saying, I have win on board, Low Puff could basically do the same thing and just be like, yeah, uh, game on that to Dene. So this card is very impressive for me. Really reminds me of Eevee Snorlax, where because it's colorless, it will find itself a home, and th these attacks are just super strong. So I definitely foresee Low Puff being a very, very strong uh, uh, card in a potential bunch of archetypes.
We then come to Sylvali GX, one of my personal favorites from the set. 210 hit point colorless type stage one that has the ability disc reload. Once during your turn, you may draw cards from your deck until you have five in hand. So it's essentially Abyssal Hand from Octillery, um, reborn in this um, stage one GX. He also comes with a couple of attacks, Buddy Brave for two colors does 50. If you played a supporter card from your hand during your turn, this does 70 more damage. Um, so again, pretty reasonable, 120, not too shabby. There's also Water Memory, don't forget. So this could be doing 240 against Fire Weak stuff, which is a really, oh, sorry, Water Weak stuff, which is a really big deal actually. Um, because one of the reasons why I gave this card a five star was because it could see playing a bunch of decks, but I definitely foresee it being in a deck alongside Volcarona as like a double stage one style deck. And you can use the Volcarona to help ping down some of these um, cards. And then Water Memory comes in and helps you beat the fire decks, basically. Which sounds really awesome, just straight out the gate. Um, it also has the White Knight GX attack for two colorless. If your opponent's active, Pokemon is an Ultra Beast. That Pokemon's knocked out. Very similar to the Alolan Ninetales um, Sublimation GX attack. Um, but it's on colorless, so it's just, again, flexible and pretty powerful. Um, you can use this to get around Beast Ring if you're using the Volcarona effectively. You could like Buddy Brave with some pings, then you can like finish off that, um, finish off the Blacephalon, then you can just like White Knight GX and finish them off. Or again, if you play Water Memories, that should be pretty uh, easy for you. Um, so yeah, the Sylvalis sounds really reasonable. Obviously, Octillery went into a whole bunch of decks. One of the reasons Octillery was so good, in fairness, was because of Brooklet Hill letting you get Remorays on board early. But at the same time, Sylvalai is cherishable, searchable, and Octillery never was. So, I mean, this Sylvalai seems pretty reasonable and reasonably searchable as well. I don't think he goes into many of the tag team decks. Um, I think Oricorio will probably be, like, the better end-proofing card um, in that regard. But I definitely think he'll be the face of this Sylvalai Volcarona deck, where you can also play the old Sylvalai. Um, because he just gives you the option to use Rebel GX, which is a really good uh, GX attack, um, just for big one-hit co potential, and gives you potentially more acceleration for your Volcaronas as well, so you don't have to keep spamming Welder turn by turn. So if I can come in and use triple acceleration, so I think that sounds really cool. Um, I feel like playing like a split of Sylvali and uh, like a couple Water Memories, and then just 4-4 Volcarona line, definitely seems like it could be like a Tier 2 contender for sure. Um, especially because it can deal with the fire deck so well with the addition of water memory. So I think the Sylvala is pretty broken, and it got the, far, the five star treatment just because of its versatility. All colorless in its costs. Uh, you can weld him, you can 3CE him, you can do all this other stuff, and he's just going to help you draw throughout the game as well. So definitely a powerful card. We finish um, the video with a Stout Land. Um, it has amazing artwork. I put this on mainly for the artwork, to be honest. It's a, it's a stage two uh, that has half half bark. Um, when you play this Pokemon from your hand to evolve, um, you can discard an energy from your opponent's active. If this Pokemon is active and is knocked out by damage from your opponent's attacks, uh, you can also discard an energy from your opponent's active. So it's like a Crawdaunt, um, obviously in a stage two form, which is way worse. But if he happens to be active and is knocked out, uh, once again, your opponent has to remove an extra energy card. So, in theory, it's two discards for one, um, which is, like, I guess a little bit of value, but ultimately I think it's pretty poor. His attacks aren't good enough to be, like, sat in the active. Overrun just as 110 and 30 to one of the opponent's bench. Yes, it's triple accelerationable, um, but overall really not worth it. So, the Stoutland is just artwork appreciation for the most part. So, that rounds out uh, the video, guys. There are the ratings. As you can see, I'm usually a little bit more harsh than the community, I try and really lay my stake in the ground and say that there's a lot of cards that won't see play. And I, uh, for once, actually agreed with the community on all five of the five-star cards that you can see on the slide here. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about this set. I think there's a lot of cards worth exploring. I'm really excited to try out the new Tag Whistle engine. I think that's going to be awesome, especially for greens decks. I've always kind of been against green decks for some, for one reason or another. So a lot of the time it was just turn one consistency. And Tag Whistle really helps um, get that sort of monkey off my back and makes me very happy to start playing some greens builds for sure. So I think that's awesome. Great Catcher completely warps the game. I If you haven't really caught on to that at this point, I've tried to drill it home in the video throughout. Um, and we've also got some great new Pokemon to attack with as well. So let me know your favorite cards from this set, guys. Thank you so much for sticking with me and listening to this big rabble. It's been a long old video. I can tell at this point my voice died a few times. I've had to have a lot of swigs of water. 
So please um, take that into account. <laughs> I don't really edit these videos. I just go for one big um, bulk upload. And uh, I hope you appreciated that I had to pause here and there for breath because I've been roaming, like running a lot of stats and numbers your way and a lot of words at you all at once. Um, I just get so into the set reviews <laughs> when I get rolling. I just can't stop myself. So yeah, hope you all enjoyed guys. And uh, I'll be coming at you with some more new set content as of um, next week, I believe. So I'm going to do a few more videos of Standard and then we're going to be jumping into new decks and all those other videos that I love to do when um, a new set comes around. So let me know your favorite cards, guys. Uh, what did I misinterpret? What have I underrated? What's going to be the busted combo for the Blastoise? What's going to be the card that busts open Arceus Dialga? Is there anything else that you disagree with? I'll hear it all down below. For now, though, it has been Joe from Omnifolk, and I'll see you in another video tomorrow. Cheers.